hello. Guys and dolls, it's good to have you here. It's a Tuesday night in December. It is, it's almost mid-December. We're right there. Can't say it just yet. Around the 14th of any month, you can say, all right, we're in the middle of the, the middle of the month. Not yet, not 13th. I can't give you that yet. But here we are on the 13th day of December 2022. And it's going to be a good one tonight. It really is as we kick off this pre-show. I've got one hell of a guest coming on. And of course, the timing is nothing short of just spectacular. And it's happened a couple of times over the last few months with, with, with guests that I've had booked for a long time. And then suddenly, their appearance is so appropriate and so well-timed. It's as if the, uh, the clockwork of the universe had synced perfectly to make this happen. We have Shane Cashman here tonight. He's a published author, a show host, writer for Tim Cast. And tonight, I get to sit down with him for a little bit. Well, for the whole show, he's in the studio to talk about his um, not only his interest in the paranormal, his travels, just the human interest stories that he he investigates all over the place. But um, we also have this incredible firsthand account of private time that Shane was able to spend with Kanye West over the last, I guess, over the last few weeks. There was this is when it all happened because part two of a two part story that he published just came out about an hour and a half before we we launched this program so i've i've been able to make some quick highlights on the on the 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 story and other things like that but thankfully we have an advantage of having the author here tonight so if i miss anything and i will also be reading super chats throughout the show tonight in case anybody has any really good questions i don't want to miss anything you might have a good um something to ask that I can't even come up with myself, not on the fly, who knows? We're all sharing consciousness tonight. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And if you didn't know how to enjoy the show with any uh, beyond what we already have going on, enjoy it with some Secret Nature CBD. That's right, secretnaturecbd.com is the promo that I'm giving you tonight, our wonderful sponsor for the evening. The best, the most, the most organic cannabis products you could find anywhere and it's legal in all 50 states because it is so high bred so high in cbd so low in thc that it is legal everywhere uh go ahead ladies and gentlemen relax focus calm your nervous system and uh, trust in the 20 years of experience in cannabis cultivation over there at Secret Nature. Everything you need for your medicine cabinet at home. Check them out. Promo code FRANKLY for 20% off. Stuff all the stockings you can with it. All right? Okay, with that being said, another real quick reminder. Tomorrow we have Jay Dyer on the show. We're going to be talking about uh, Christmas, how Christmas and Santa and other Christmas pagan myths we're going to be busting. Uh, Tim Gordon, Timothy Gordon will be on on the 15th going to be talking uh, some St. Nick stories. You know, St. Nicholas was a uh, was a brawler, you know. Um, and then, of course, on the weekend, Saturday night, it's going to be the Saturday night cocktail special over here. I'm going to have, I'll be brewing a, uh, a cocktail of some, some sort. I'll be letting you all know the recipe beforehand, and Saturday night is our Saturday special. I think my wife, Lauren, is going to be here co-hosting with me, so, because everybody else is gone. Uh, everybody has birthday parties and that's just the way it's going to be. Then next week, we have Rich Barris, Chris Ann Hall, John Paul Rice. A lot of good stuff leading up to Christmas. All right. Now let's get into the grab bag because we're going to be doing a little bit of this. And then we go to our intro. We bring Shane on and we have a good time. So right now, everybody, just find yourself a seat, relax, and pour yourself a nice heartwarming cup of something. All right. The first one up over here is some interesting footage. I'm sure a lot of people find it interesting, and it could just be nothing at all. But there was a massive fire reported at New York Police Department's, or one of the New York Police Department's control rooms, the evidence control and impound warehouse. So I guess it's a lot of um, impounded cars and, and other things. But other, you can't stop the internet from wondering what else was being destroyed at the same time. What can I say? It's New York. It's New York. What can I say? 
That's it. That's the fire trucks. They're going to go put it all out. Save all the evidence. Now, this one got me really upset. This next headline got me really upset. I read in New York Post there was a man with swollen testicles who discovered dancing worms living inside of his... Inside of his testicles. The wor- Why? The dancing worms of a man... This brings bizarre new meaning to the term ballroom dancing. A 26-year-old man in India revolted the internet after it was revealed that his swollen right testicle was caused by microscopic worms that had infiltrated his scrotum. He's dancing. On ultrasound examination shown in a video, moving structures were seen within a dilated lymphatic channel. Doctors wrote in the case study of the incident, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine's latest issue, the case study reported that Max Super Specialty, Max Super Specialty Hospital in New Delhi, that, that doesn't sound like a hospital name that you would hear in India. After experiencing pain and swelling in the scrotum and low-grade fevers for a month, on examination there was a tenderness and swelling of the right side of the scrotum, study authors wrote, Subsequent ultrasound scans revealed that the Delhi native, Delhi, Delhi, had tiny dancers boogieing up. Stop, stop describing it like this. Tiny dancers boogieing about in his nether region as seen in the family jewels photo. Look at this grossness. Oh my God, what did they do? Lymphatic filarius, filarius? I don't know how to say it. Commonly known as elephantitis. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Elephantiasis. I know what elephantitis is. A neglected tropical disease that occurs when mosquito bite infects the patient's system with a species of microscopic roundworm. Gross. Oh, I'm so sorry for this guy. Hopefully they got all the the damn dancers out of there, though. But speaking about um, dancing worms... Elon Musk disbands Trust and Safety Council at Twitter. The dancing worms over there no longer have a job after inaction on child porn. Twitter has dissolved its Trust and Safety Council after new owner Elon Musk, who's going to be a pretty sizable part of the conversation tonight with with Shane. I can't wait to ask him all these questions. He's got insight that not a lot of people have at this point. Um... Oh, new owner Elon Musk criticized the group over long-standing lack of action to rid the platform of child sexual abuse material, which is one of the most objectively good things that he has brought to the table the last uh, few months in this entire story. It's been great. As Twitter moves into new phase, this is a quote, we are reevaluating how best to bring external insights into our product and policy development work. As part of this process, we have decided that the Trust and Safety Council is not the best structure to do this. Read an email to the council's members. Right. Our work to make Twitter a safe, informative place will be moving faster and more aggressively than ever before, and we will continue to welcome your ideas going forward about how to achieve this goal. The email continues. We will also continue to explore opportunities to provide focused and timely input to our work. So that's one thing you can say. Another thing you can say, I should say. And the last one here also had to do with Elon Musk, but a little bit more of a laugh out loud kind of a thing. Elon Musk has now lost the title of richest person in the world. Apparently somebody has leapfrogged over him. And why is that funny? Because um, no one knows the names of the richest people in the world. Okay, these are merely the biggest fish that are swimming in the public pool. So I don't give a shit. And neither should you. It means absolutely nothing. With that being said, I think we've wrapped up nice. I think wrapped up nicely. And I, I did it earlier than I ever did before. It's only 7.04. So we're going to get the show started because I want every spare minute I can get uh, with Shane Cashman and hang out with all of you guys. General interest and then, of course, all of his recent work that we need to discuss. Don't go anywhere. Share the show far and wide. I published all of the live viewing links on Twitter, on Truth. on I put it all over the place. So go in. Become a social media sponsor tonight and share the hell out of it. We will be right back. Don't go anywhere.
You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's rock! Shake your hand. All right. 706. Welcome to the show. The pre show is over. Now it's just the real thing. So give this episode a thumbs up, share the link with everyone you know, and keep dumping those super chats on us. Quite frankly, superchat.com. There's also the Rumble Rants. There's the Gold Pills on Quite Frankly.tv. There's the, the tips on Rockfin. And we're going to be checking in on them a little bit more frequently tonight. So, uh, as I said before, our guest this evening is a man named Shane Cashman, and he's here with us tonight. Shane, how the hell are you doing, man? I'm sleepless, but better than ever. Dude, I could not believe, first of all, I had I, who, your assistant's name. What, what's her name? You're talking, uh, Isabel. Isabel. Yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah, she's the best. So, she reached out, and I said, you know, um, it was just when... October was wrapping up yeah. and I read about all of the work that you do with the paranormal you you are a uh, you host a show called Tales of the Inverted World yep yep UFOs encounters uh, cryptids ghosts interdimensional stuff this is what we talk about all throughout the year yeah but in October there's nothing like it right so to, to have you on now I was like damn we missed them in the in the sweet spot but still this is just as good yeah. When did you start doing this? Uh, well, I was freelancing for different magazines, writing like weird true crime stuff for a while. Um, but then with Tim at, at Timcast, I started almost two years ago now. And you know, I, I met up with him in West Virginia, and we came up with this idea of tales from the inverted world. We wanted to talk about the paranormal stuff, and you know, we both agree, and I think you'll agree as well that we live in the inverted world. <laughs> you know, yes. everything's upside down, everything's wild, everything's crazy and dark. But um. So yeah, we, we decided to do that. And it's funny, it started out to just to be an article a week type situation. And after a few months, Tim and I were like, I think we just have a book here. So we're just gonna start doing books. So we turned a lot of it into uh, the first book, which is at invertedworldbook.com. And that's like the UFO encounters, that is simulation theory, it's the rat experiments, um, and then my like pretty long investigation into the Long Island serial killer. Oh. And uh, yeah, so that that one got dark because I kind of got a little too invested with uh, the online detectives, and I, I went down that rabbit hole. Uh, While well, my wife was massively pregnant with our, our first, yeah, and uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, it's, <laughs> not, it's not to be. I'll tell you, w to to be dipping that deep into the macabre is uh, is something that that you you can't shake off. You you've carried around with you the entire time. Yeah, it's very hard to put it down and walk away. I was born with it. Like, I was born and raised in a very old house, like, in, in West Point mm. and uh, on a military academy. We're civilian, but, like, my parents, like, work with horses. So we're on a farm in the middle of nowhere. And so I, I think I was just raised with ghosts, right? Like, we would just go, grow up always talking to the ghosts of the house. And uh, they, were, they were rather pleasant ghosts. But um, so I had that going on in my head the whole time. But the serial killer thing definitely got too dark just because at a certain point, like, as you know, in any online forum, people just turn on each other. So when, it's, when you include the idea of a serial killer, they're just threatening each other, th claiming they're the serial killer and stuff like that. <laughs> and then, you know, we thought we found someone, we're calling the FBI, like we're, we're losing our minds on this whole thing. And um, so yeah, we, we, we do that for uh, TimCast.com. The first season, every episode, I narrate and it's illustrated, and that's on YouTube. 
and then the second the second season is exclusive to TimCast.com, and both uh, seasons are turned into books at the end. Well, let me a, let me ask you this. I I, I want to know because I know the other thing that really uh, shocked me is that you and I share an alma mater. Yeah. We, we both went to Manhattanville College, and then you you worked there for a while. Yeah. So. What were you teaching there? And I want to know that transition between you're working uh, as a professor or something like you're, you're, you're teaching, and yeah. then you are all of a sudden you're, you're writing paranormal and chasing ghosts and all that for Tim Timcast. Yeah. So what, how does that happen? I always wanted to be a professor. I wanted to teach writing. I wanted to teach poetry and fiction and journalism. And uh, this is before I understood just how uh, rotten the institution was, <laughs> you know. And so I went to yeah, I went to SUNY Purchase, it was like a state school first, and I was uh, rejected every time I applied to be in the writing program. So I just did English, and then I always had this goal in mind: I want to teach. I love teaching and talking about ideas. Uh, so when I left Purchase, I went to Manhattanville for my master's program, which I loved. Like, great professors there. It was a great, great place. So much so that, like, my wife and I got married there. Oh, you uh, you would know. The Lady Chapel with the glass ceiling. Absolutely. The little chapel. So that was, like, where we had our, we had our wedding. Wow. Beautiful place. I would it teach is. all my classes in that little chapel. We would just leave the rooms. So I was like, it's better to have sunlight. We can be cold. You know, we'll just sit in the, in the yes. dirt floor with a few pews in the sunlight. Um, so, yeah, so what happened with all that was, you know, it was almost 10 years of struggling as an adjunct professor. And you probably know, but, like, adjuncts are, they make up the majority of the school system. Uh, I think at Manhattanville, as of when I was there last, which was two years ago, I want to say it's something like if there's 400 professors, 300 are adjuncts. And for those who don't know what an adjunct means, it's uh, you know it's basically someone who acts as a full-time professor, teaches just as many classes usually as a full-time professor, but has no benefits, has very little pay, has no job security. You never know if you're being welcomed back the next semester. Uh, you're you're told to have office hours, but you don't have an office, so it's a, it, it's chaos. But I loved teaching. I loved sitting in a room with like 15 students and just talking about ideas, workshopping ideas growing you know making them the best they can be because i i honestly feel and i still feel this way like if you know how to read well and communicate well you can excel in any any industry you want to go to is that what you were or were you doing anything in language or what was the actual thing that you were yeah so at manhattanville teaching? it was it was like a mix i did fiction um i did a journalism class and then i kind of just like took over a class that was probably supposed to be about something else and i just like tweaked it to my, I, I called it like something like a how to be hyper aware. You know, we just kind of did everything. We did a little bit of poetry, a little bit of journalism, a little bit of fiction, just so I can get like a well-rounded, uh, you know, scope of ri all writing. So I did that for years and always hoping like I would actually become a real professor. Mm. You know, I wanted to take care of my family. I was also a furniture mover throughout this whole time. So I would move furniture from like six in the morning to four at night, teach night classes. Uh, and that was like a struggle, you know, my, my skeleton is not happy with me <laughs> because of all the furniture I moved of all the dead people's houses I would be in cleaning out their house for their grieving families. So, yeah, I was doing that, you know, to supplement the, the professor job, which I hope to turn into a real thing. And then basically when COVID hit, you know, it was kind of like percolating. And there was like this fear happening. We didn't know if it was going to come here, right? And the students were getting really worried. And I felt like I wanted to protect their their brains from this chaos. I remember telling them on the day before, like, the school was shut down. I was like, you know, every generation has its scar. This could be our scar, but it might be nothing. I was trying to be really hopeful. I was like, we'll be fine. And then we got sent home for good. <laughs> and everything was on Zoom, which I hated. I, I really don't like being on Zoom. Um, I think you lose a lot of like body language and like, you know, the people being honest with criticisms and stuff like that. So I really didn't like it, but the semester ended. As you know, New York was shut down. It was near impossible to find another job. And I was forced to go on unemployment for the first time in my life. And I was like super depressed. I was like, I, I was also a freelancer and nothing was happening. I couldn't get any more freelancing gigs. I, I couldn't get any other teaching jobs. I was trying to do all these different things. Nothing was panning out, just making, just barely getting by and that summer ended I went back to school back to getting my little pay at, at, at uh, Manhattanville and then I got these crazy letters in the mail saying you owe the state like all the money you got from unemployment and I already had like this horrible feeling of like even having to do that uh, and I was really upset and then now this because I found out my my colleges had um, reported me and every other adjunct to the state because there's a law in New York that says adjuncts aren't allowed to get unemployment. 
So I had to fight them. And I remember f I found out, and it was just like the, it was just the, the last thing I needed with this, you know, between how they treat you at the school, you know, nothing about the students. The students are, were, for the most part, great. But the, the way that the schools teach you uh, or treat you, uh, the way, you know, all that stuff. And then I found out this. So I basically just got on in my classroom and I was like, guys, I love teaching. I love you guys, but I'm done. And I told them, I was like, do you know what an adjunct professor is? They're like, no. I was like, I told them, basically, I just told you. And I was like, I'm going to miss you guys, but I got to prepare for court now because I'm taking this school to court. And you should know, like, where your money goes and all this stuff. Wow. Took them to court, and I won. It just meant I didn't have to pay anything. And uh, I had nothing lined up. I was literally uh, training to be a tour guide at West Point, like, going on the bus every day. And I was also going to go drive a truck. And I was just, that's what you're going to do, right? I had lots of crazy jobs, and that was just the next path. However, sorry to make this a long story, but six months before that, I had applied for this job that I heard Tim talk about on IRL, which was writing these, like, weird stories, these weird dark stories. And two weeks after I quit the job at, at Manhattanville, Tim hit me up, and I flew to West Virginia, and that's that. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. That's, that, dude, I mean, that's... And, and then, so pretty much when you, and because uh, I know I was checking out your your uh, your YouTube and everything else, you travel around. They they subsidize your travel and all that to be able to go and do the stories. It's a dream job. It's just, it's incredible because you, you're inquiring about things like Confederate gold. Yeah. And uh, you know it, 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 all these amazing human interest stories. That is yeah. a dream Tim, job. Tim is the best boss. Like because like I had uh, I, my freelance jobs at magazines were drying up because I had come out with like some some writing that was very critical of uh, a lot of things that people in the corporate media were in favor of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just like not hearing back from people anymore. But I, you know I, I didn't really care. I mean I, I could have used the money, but. That, so like working with Tim is like I have the freedom to express myself in every possible way that I I want and uh, and then I can just pitch him ideas and be like hey uh, how do you feel about me going to Georgia to look for this Confederate gold and uh, th uh, the next thing I know I'm on a plane like last October and basically spend uh, kind of like back and forth through six or seven months there looking for this gold. Those are the only stories that fucking matter anymore. Dude. Yes, dude. It really they, they're, I, they're the only stories that matter anymore because. I, there cannot be this. It cannot. I think if you look at what we're what we're fed every day, if you look at these the mindless conversations that we're in and the 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 debates that we're locked inside of, it just everything is a dead end. Mm. The world cannot be that hopeless and cold and simple. There's got to be something. There's got to be more and more wonder to discover and rediscover than ever before. Right. Because this is this is not real. Right. This is the worst simulation I've ever fucking experienced. <laughs> it's it's rough, but it's beautiful. I mean, I think people just forgot to look at the joy and the beauty of the world. It's because it's so much darkness. Uh, that you're fed through everything you might see, whether it's social media or whatever news you read, right, left, whatever. You know, people literally, it's like people forgetting to look up when they're in the city, right? And there's like a beautiful skyline, beautiful sky. Like there is still beauty out there, even though you feel like you're in a prison or on a prison planet at most of the time. But yeah, that was a deal. Like that was the goal always with me is even though these like the paranormal stories can be really dark. We talk about crazy stuff like murder and ghosts and haunting, sleep paralysis, whatever. There is some, it, it it unlocks something in your perception of the world that like it's so much more fascinating and interesting than you remember because it's like how do you remember the world as a kid how big did it feel right how much summers felt longer nights were darker you know things were scarier things were more beautiful you know it's just so writing these kind of stories it transports me back to that kind of feeling well it, it goes without saying and i know you don't like zoom but you're gonna and i know that you're you're you live in west virginia now but you're gonna have to come back on the show quite a bit yeah dude to, to be able to get through even a pinprick of the stuff that you do oh yeah because th this is the kind of these are the, this is the material that we have to spread out across an entire year yeah. to i'd be love to i have no problem driving up here i have family up here still so I got to see my mother-in-law and my mom today, so I was like, it's perfect. Well, then we'll do this more often. Yeah, man. We're, already, we're only 10 minutes into this. We're already <laughs> saying it. But, you know, before we – because I have some grab bag stuff that we can do in the second half, all very weird stuff that leads – and I have some questions about your, your travels there too because uh, obviously – uh, when you go out looking for the strange and the magnificent, you find a lot of things that that leave you know, leave a mark on you. Whether you get freaked out, I know that you have a uh, being followed story, uh, so I want to know about that. I want to know about other things. And when you're collecting other people's experiences, uh, that's that's another thing all all together. Yeah. Uh, me, I don't have any. Thank God. <laughs> 
I don't have any, uh, you know, uh, poltergeist experiences. I don't have any stories of children with the blacked out eyes right. knocking on my door at three in the morning. Yeah. I don't have any, nothing like that, but I'll collect them from yeah. somebody else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll change that tonight. We'll see who uh, we can conjure up. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so before we get into all that, I have to talk about the most, uh, I mean, the most time sensitive thing, and that is your Kanye West experience. Yeah. Um, when he walked out of Timcast, we were talking about it. I mean, I talked about it the next day from uh, a couple of different standpoints, including a you know a, a, a hosting standpoint. How do you keep them? How do you keep them in the room and not let it just be a twenty minute broadcast? What was going on out outside of the, the room? You were seeing all that stuff. Yeah, I have part one of this. Uh, here it is, right here. Cashman, the case for pre for President Ye, part one. Two days with Ye on God, exile, and radical love. Now, this came out when? This was on December 7th. Yeah, almost a week ago. And you start off right here. I'm just going to jump around, and you can fill in however you like. Yeah. The internet was blowing up as Ye stood there freakishly nonchalant. He wasn't looking at his phone. He wasn't smiling, but he didn't appear angry either. Uh, he looked straight ahead past Milo and seemed satisfied. So you you and how many other people were there around him as he's... Uh, in that room, there, there must have been at least 15 of us, you know, like... And this is after guards. he walked out. This is like a minute after he walked out. Okay. And it's right by the studio. And I knew he would be there. I wasn't even in that room. I, I, I walked in that room probably right as he walked down the steps. And uh, I walked past the armed guards and, you know, fellow employees. And it was it was chaotic. Like, it was funny to see just chaos because we're like one of the most popular people on earth just walked out of the studio. And, you know, I thought Tim was doing a fine job, but when I heard Ye say he was going to walk out, I'm like, I think he's going to walk out. Like, I'm a longtime fan. I've, I've seen this before. Like, it's it's very possible, right? So I was like, I, I was bummed because I wanted to see that continue. That's all I want is to see him uh, is to see him talk, interact, at, be asked questions and stuff. So I just like my, my brain was just like, well, I'm going to go walk to him. And be, I felt like I could save this. <laughs> uh, my ego was kicking in. So I just I made a beeline for him. He was super calm. You would think like it would have been a little more hectic with him, but as as crazy as everyone else was around him, he was super calm. And I just went right up to him and I was just like I told him when I told him the story, like, dude, I believe in you, man. I believe uh, what what you're doing. Um, I'm a I'm a fan. Like, and I just wish you'd go back to the studio and tell everyone else why they should believe in you as well, because I think it's important. And I love this conversation. And like he had made up his mind. Uh, but he was like listening very intently. I didn't expect him to listen to me that intently. Uh, and so it was eye contact and everything. Eye contact, like within inches of each other. And I'm like trying not to think like the, it's like I, I, don't, I really don't care about celebrities. Like I don't ever want to meet anybody. Uh, but he is the only person like who I really do look up to as an artist and, and many for many different reasons, whether it's music or design, uh, just art in general. So it was really out of body to just be like, with him telling him this uh, but he had made up his mind and there wasn't any changing it uh, so I was like well if I have this moment I'm going to just pivot and talk about music real quick so after he grabbed Luke's cookies off the counter which he, he did do and start eating them I just like yo man uh, I love that opera you made like he made an opera I don't think a lot of people watched it and it's beautiful and we, we pulled up to like the, the clip and we just talked about that talked about music and then it just he literally just uh, said he took my name and number down that was my. That was gonna be my next question because I had to do a lot of skim reading with this. I knew yeah. you were gonna be here. I wanted yeah. some highlights. So y you were one of the first and probably the only people to be talking to him after he's downstairs. Yeah. And uh, and then here you are a, a little while later, and he <laughs> asks for your your uh, your contact. Yeah. How do you? How does? How? It, so then he's the next one to reach out to you. Then. So he has. So it's Nick Fuentes is next to me. I don't know anything about Nick at this point. I, I did like a week of research with on him just to like get an idea. So he's sitting next to me, and Milo Yiannopoulos is like like I say in the story, he's watching the TV. He's like gauging Tim's reaction as he's continuing IRL. Uh, you know, it's 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 in disarray. Uh, I mean, so so yeah, he tells Nick to take my name and number, and then he's like, you need to fly to LA, or you should fly to LA, is what he said. And I was like. All right, <laughs> so they get in their car, they bounce, and I, oddly enough, had become friendly with Milo just two weeks prior because he came by and did IRL, and I've been a fan of Milo's for you know years, mm -hmm. so it was a big deal to meet him. Uh, I just you know the way he uses language is is very important to me. I love the way he he can debate people. I love the way he writes. 
So just like I didn't put this in the story just because it just seemed like too much, but it's worth telling. Like I was with him at our at my editor's place when Ye had just called him to be working on the campaign. So I was like, in my head, I'm like whoa, <laughs> you know, I came here to meet Milo. And now I was like, I'm one step away from Kanye, who I'm a huge fan of, and I want to write a story. So I had been writing this story just amorphously for a week or two, never expecting to meet Kanye, never expect any of this stuff to happen. Then they show up, it falls apart, he gets my name and number. So then I'm in contact with Nick and Milo and uh, our editor, Cassandra, and they're all, we're all just like coordinating this. And it's like four literal days of sleeplessness. Cause I'm like, this might happen or it might not. And I'm prepared for either way. I feel like the 10 minutes I got with him at IRL um, were amazing. You know, I could, I, I had a story that I, I really could have told there and I was very happy with it. I was like on a high from that whole situation. But uh, f I guess four days went by cause it was yeah Thursday morning at 4 AM. Milo hit me up and like, he was like, yay approved it. Get on the plane basically. Okay. All right, and now here we are. Here's another thing you said. People should have learned a long time ago not to write Ye off as a as unstable, an unstable, mentally ill, racist, white supremacist, or anti-Semitic. Uh, from merely a fan's perspective, your worst insults only help fuel the man's determination. He has yet to prove to me, anyways, that he is any of those things. Is his messaging always the clearest? No, but I believe he comes from a good place. Now. The, the 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 were you hanging out with him before or right after the Alex Jones appearance on Infowars? <laughs> oh man, this is funny. So, I I'm on my way to the airport. My my buddy Ryan's taking me, and he's on Infowars as it's ha as I'm in the car to the airport. And people are hitting me up. They're like, "This is it. He's gone too far." <laughs> you know, like I ha like people I work with. <laughs> friends my mom i don't even know how she knows like she doesn't know i don't think she even knows who alex jones is but it, the information is getting to her and everybody else and no one knows i'm going there except for my wife yay you know milo nick and tim and uh so i'm just like okay yep and i'm getting like hit up with like what he's saying we're trying to watch it and i'm like at my my gut reaction is like i don't think it's as bad as you are saying it is it sounds bad. I haven't really thought it through yet, but also like this is nothing incredibly unique to him, like as an artist or, or just someone who speaks in public, because like I say in part two, if, if anyone paid close enough attention to him, this is kind of like inevitable because he's the guy who openly forgave the doctor who killed his mother um, and said he was going to use a picture of his of the doctor on an album cover. So like this like idea of like loving people that might have caused mass harm is like this very interesting but obviously very christian idea that he's been talking about forever so like i wasn't like oh thrown off guard but i was definitely like feeling the anxiety of um everybody telling me how horrible this was while i'm literally about to go see him <laughs> which never i never would have imagined would have been happening in the first place and i get that a lot from people and i've, I've read it i've read it and I've, we've had uh, we had a, a, a big call-in show on that uh maybe about two days after the Infowars appearance and that was expressed by by a number of people that it it was a a, a really it was a one of the the purest expressions of uh, of a christian mentality of forgiveness mm -hmm. to be able to go to that extreme and 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 face the slings and arrows of everybody who mm -hmm. obviously you have a, a, a gr an amazing amount of people who for the most part are generations removed from the life of this man adolf hitler right. that find it find themselves absolutely incapable of thinking about anything that we can do as a group but to constantly hate this man together hate this man together right. and have that drive decision making yep. me i have no affinity for him right. one 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 way or another but right. i always i don't understand why here we are 80 some odd years later and people freeze up at the at the the utterance of his name i had family who literally had to deal with him who were in the holocaust like mm -hmm. i have family who fled russia for the pogroms and i look at both of those situations as terrible situations and i never really understood why one gets talked about more than the other because for years i've been saying like why aren't we talking about mal why aren't we talking about pol pot why are we talking about stalin you know like and and something that nick said and like i, I really enjoyed talking to him because even though he and i disagree on on some stuff I agree with his phrase, the inconsistency of standards, where it's like, why can some people just openly say they love someone like Mao, <laughs> right? And that should disturb you, because Mao, if you go look up like the Cultural Revolution. Che Guevara. Che, like all these things, it's like, 
you are wearing shirts of these people, some of these people. And to me, they're, they're, I think, even worse than Hitler, right? Like, they're all bad, but now, like, there's some things that were just so disturbing to me. Um, and, but it's not, it's, it's literally everybody. Every government has done horrible, horrible things. You know, I think I mentioned in the first piece, like, the things we've done. You know, I talk about Tuskegee, and that's just a fraction of that. You know, I talk about, or I think I talk about, like, what uh, Japan was doing to China and things like Unit 731. These things that are just so heinous. Uh, so it's like, and, and also we, we like live in a world where victimhood is currency. So to just use one type of victimhood as currency, I just like, I'm just over all of that. And what he's doing, you know, I pretty quickly was seeing as like, is I mean, what I call in the title, like radical love, where it's like, it's super controversial sounding. I get it. My mom is not happy with it, but like he's extending love and forgiveness to even the worst. And that is christ-like right that's what, and that is literally what he's trying to do and um and i think he also knows and i'm just like this is just me surmising like he can't just come at it with like this nuanced thing like that's just not how he works right there's certain artists in the world like johnny rotten you know i think of marilyn manson or even someone like andy kaufman where like you kind of use language as an atom bomb and you say something for, i think with good intentions and you just watch the reaction and then it goes from there and, and it good or bad it's shifted the whole conversation mm -hmm. which i find like, super interesting yeah uh, I, I, so you were raised jewish yeah and uh, what about your children yeah my children are being raised christian i married a christian and a uh, lot of early debates between me and my wife um but it's important to me that they're raised christian and i've been going to church and i don't know what to call myself right now but i do a podcast called ready slow with my buddy sean strong he's in atlanta speaking of zoom i do zoom all the time with him so i, I don't really hate it that well, much i understand zoom to teach a class yeah. is this different from doing <laughs> media i understand but, that, but yeah. me and sean like for two years and he's oh, what does he consider he's a christian but he's i forget exactly which type he considers himself but we've kind of gone through this journey of like how i'm seeing church and how i'm seeing like I find such a beauty and hope in Christianity and uh, I love reading about it and reading about it in a new way and yeah I was my dad's Catholic though so like I had this interesting upbringing where I'm hearing these conversations my whole life between my mom and my dad and super interesting to me like I, I always read both books the old and the new testament the new one I didn't know as well because you know we were raised Jewish but um so yeah then when I got with my wife you know we've been together forever we had these really interesting conversations and I was just not with it early on. Like I considered myself a liberal 10, 12 years ago and we'd get in all these d discussions. Thankfully, she's much smarter than me and schooled me on literally every argument. My, I would feel like that my argument would just end at a certain point and she would just crush me. I was like, all right, I don't know what this yeah. is about here. I don't, I don't know what's going on in my brain, but, but I was listening and I love these conversations because I, like I always told my students, like get yourself and interesting and challenging conversations because you'll challenge the immune system of your ideas. So that's what happened with me and Nancy, and I'm forever grateful. So, I you know we've been surfing different churches in West Virginia. We've been going here and there. Cause it's just so far, it's not so far. We found one we like, but like it's hard to find one that you feel like you click with. Like right. it's it's still very new to me. It's very important to me, but it's still very new. And I know sometimes when I sit down. I just feel further from God in some places. Like it's like, I, usually I feel closer to God outside in the world, you know, um, doing sto writing stories, being with my kids, you know, seeing the birth of a child, you know, the first time they smiled, things like that. So there were certain churches, I was just like, this is not for us, but I find a, a beautiful simplicity into the one we found now. And it's in a very old building and high ceilings, you know, it's like civil war era. And uh, it's just something so beautiful and hopeful about it. And that, you know, those are things I've been, really like latching on to uh in the past like few years and uh you know i'm also into like i'm actually wearing the nick cave shirt right now oddly enough i love nick cave and the bad seeds mm -hmm. and he he put out a book recently uh that's love all about him, this. Man. oh dude he's the man he's a great artist great writer uh all this stuff so his book he put out was all about this kind of thing too that i've been thinking about which is like grief christianity you know art uh, COVID, all these things, and uh, I highly recommend that book. I, I just finished it like a, a month ago. Well, the reason why I ask is because, it's, it's, and well, I, I, first of all, your personal journey is is, is 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 interesting in this respect because you are covering, aside from being a long-standing fan of Kanye West, you're covering a particular ride right now that is very spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, the, our greatest battle for humanity. Right now is spiritual. It's yep. not. It's not. We are in a. Po I 
I say it all the time, we're in a post-political world. We're in a post-constitutional nation. Yep. We're in a post-political world. Mm -hmm. We are we have devolved into sectarianism. And, but the other side of it is that the battle that needs to be waged now is spiritual. Yep. And um, we can get into that in, uh, in, in other in future shows because there's so much there. But I, there is this one thing here you're, you wrote about as you took your seat on the plane going out there. You said, as I took my seat on the plane and I waited to take off, I saw a headline about a quantum computer simulating a wormhole, and everything started to make perf a perfect, uh, perfectly absurd sense. We flew 500 miles per hour from D.C. to L.A., and it didn't feel fast enough. I hadn't slept in four days. I was a giant eyeball flying over L.A. The cultural pendulum pendulum was swinging back and forth across the nation like an axe. The simulation was on fire. That is one thing. That last thing right there, the simulation was on fire. That is one great way to encapsulate what those two weeks were like. Yeah. Especially that. Yeah, that was on my mind uh, heavily. Uh, and it, it felt like that. It felt like, you know, it wasn't just yay. There's a lot of things happening in that weekend because that's the same weekend that the Twitter files were coming out. <laughs> so, like, literally, like, the narrative uh, was just falling apart. And it was so beautiful. And I felt like I was flying into it. Like I tell Tim in the story, I, I was like, yo, I'm flying into a war zone, feels like. And, you know, I'm, it felt like everything that is important to me converged in this story. You know, my, my Jewish upbringing, my, my, my disgust of censorship, my path uh, with Christianity, um, my love of Kanye's music, politics, like literally everything had just fallen together and it's like how can you not feel like this is some ridiculous blessing that i just been like carried and put in like this perfect opportunity for me to like really think about those things deeply and like and i also say this in a story but it's like the simulation like i don't really think of it in like the sense of like the zeros and ones that like i think elon musk like might think about or bostrom you know it's like i think corporate media i think our ridiculous government i think they've like laid this like organism of a simulation on top of our base reality base reality being god's reality and like we're just kind of like living through it and like we were saying earlier people aren't paying attention enough mm -hmm. and they're just like in their zone um not looking up not looking inside of themselves and that's the problem and when yay did what he did on alex jones as wild as it seemed to everybody else he shattered something and i and i was immediately after my anxiety went away once i got to la uh, even though I didn't know yet what was happening with him because when I landed I found out he landed in Miami So I was like this is definitely not happening. Um, I, I I felt like this beautiful feeling of hope come over me um, and he, I was still getting hit up with like negative texts, but I was like I when you say post politics like that's something I say too and I, I just have a problem looking for hope clearly in any politician. You shouldn't look up to anybody yeah. to save you, right? It really falls on you, especially when you're a parent, like you feel this way, like nothing's gonna come swoop in and help you. It's certainly not the government. So, you know, I felt really, really good. I was kind of floating, even not knowing what was gonna happen that weekend. I was just like, this idea of forgiving, this idea of like me having the last two years uh, deciding to like kind of like step out and say things that cause friction you know in my writing which I, I never really wanted to do losing friends being called horrible names being accused of violence because of the poems i wrote like ridiculous ridiculous things i found myself already feeling like i'm just going to forgive people i'm not going to hold in any resentment we were all in a really crazy place. I understand a lot of wrong things were done, and I don't want to sweep under. The, I want. I don't want to sweep, sweep them under the rug, but I'm not going to let resentment rule me anymore. As, and I don't want my kids to see that either. Not that they do, but like I try to shield them from the doom of the world. But I, I want them to just live a nice, innocent childhood as much as possible. You know, of course they're going to inherit the darkness at some point, and they'll hopefully, my wife and I have raised them well enough to fight against it. Um, but yeah, I was like. I'm going to start just forgiving. I'm going to start leading with love. And uh, I was very thankful for that. There's And there's so much more here that it, I, that I want to talk about. In, in I mean, how the hell? You guys are talking about <laughs> Tesla. <you know>? So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking yeah. at here. He, well, <laughs> here's another one. Ye was finishing a conversation on his phone when a woman joined us at the table. Christianity, this is a quote, Christianity has a soft spot for the transgressive, she said. 
Uh, Ye going on Alex Jones was transgressive in the most Christian way. She, who is this, this mystery woman? So I, she told me I couldn't use her name, but she's like a friend in the circle. Uh, I believe she's like a photographer. Really, really interesting woman. Let me, okay. You're a guy who is obviously in touch with your, your, your gut, okay? And you look at the world through uh, a certain lens that tries to decipher multiple layers of reality. You were just talking about before you went, you know, twelve years ago being an, an atheist yep. Jew, yep. pretty much, yep. to now, re, you know, seeing a layer of God's reality that's being built on top of it with all the superficial shit. Yep. And now we're talking about the government doesn't is not going to help us. I mean, that's great for a liberal to go from right. the government does everything. I that, will say though, as a liberal, I still felt the same way about the government. Right? It was just I was not seeing it the same way. Like I think I was just not defining it as the way everyone else was like I still my whole life has been like anti-establishment right like I just never trusted the government but it was like certain values that I thought I believed in that were set, certain uh, started to shift in me but like yeah the uh, it's funny because like to my friends who are more left-leaning they're like you changed so much but the things I started speaking out about the most were like free speech you know and like censorship which is what I've always cared about but just to them that looks so far right because they didn't realize they moved so far left well what about that and, and that's true that's what i said before i say it uh, i said it about a couple of years ago and everybody keeps kept talking about the rise of the far right so the far right is not rising you're falling <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean exactly. that's just it is you <laughs> fell off the cliff you're looking at this this you know this this contra zoom mm -hmm. you know and and they think that there's something else going on there's a problem with you um but the, what i was getting at here is you've got this Obviously, you're, you're you're refocusing a lot of your consciousness, and you're you're on a, a really um, productive trip right now. And when you're over there and you're hanging out with Kanye West, and you're you're hanging out with uh, some of his inner circle people and Nick Fuentes and all that, do you feel did you feel any kind of um I don't know intrusive steering presence there yeah. how open was the energy because you know he's coming from a place where we know now that there's literal mk ultra personal trainer you know mm -hmm. handlers that yep. have been attached to him yep. like those little parasite fish that attach the sharks <laughs> right uh you know what was the energy like around the people yeah, he has now that was in my mind and i definitely that was a, a thought that a lot of people had shared with me as well you know like oh so and so is just using him right so uh, I'm prepared to meet someone who I look up to and be let down and I'm looking for that as well But like honestly rather quickly I see that it's just a, a collaborative effort and there's I don't get a sense of like anyone Infiltrating his brain, you know, or trying to use him to do this or that uh, You know a lot of people would be like oh he just surrounds himself with yes men but there's so many times uh, where he like people agree with him and he's like questioning why they agreed with him. He's like, are you saying that because I'm saying that? You know, I think he's like almost too self-aware at times. But like I've seen him just disagree with people in the circle, whether it's Nick or whoever. You know, it's like and they there's no like it's not animosity. It's just like I see them working on ideas. I see them very open to the collaboration. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't get that sense at all i saw yay running the whole thing and being like this is me and i saw nick you know for what i know of him now like who was he was super nice to me uh i saw him even like you know trying to shift his views to make sure they're the best for what yay is trying to do with his campaign possible campaign because it's not like official yet but like you know so i didn't experience that i saw someone who was like in complete control and probably uh, this might not be the best word, but probably has a bit of PTSD from prior handlers because you know something he's obviously very aware of and like people out there were like the the Pasternak stuff mm. So I think he's very keen on that like uh, on at least like being observant on who might be doing that But yeah, I didn't feel that I didn't get that impression at all and and, and, as, and for somebody who has such a um, uh, very strong interest in the unknown and upside down worlds and all that I mean, you spent two days with them. Was there any, because I, I have not been able to read every syllable here. <laughs> How dare you? I know. <laughs> but it, the conversation with him, especially observing him over the last couple of months, mm -hmm. it's a doorway into really incredible and probably scary inside track stories to mind control, to ritual sacrifice, to cloning cults. Mm -hmm. Even I mean, even though he, he brought up the whole Raelian uh, Star of David mixed with the the swastika in yep. here, and he describes it in your your um, your piece here. I think in part one or something, 
as just a hey hug it out kind of moment right that he wasn't re- he, he didn't pay any real mention of the the Raelian cloning cult that it belonged yeah. to yeah I don't think that even dawned on him <laughs> okay so so did you did you have any kind of uh, MK ultra insider baseball conversation it's funny, like I didn't I wish I did and uh, I was part of my notes but it just never really came up like I, I was really focused on what is this campaign and I wanted I wanted to try to take it seriously you know I, I thought I was seeing something that w- was serious and I I found out he was way serious so I focused on that and like yeah we went off on different tangents here and there but that didn't come up and I in retrospect I wish it did because it did come up right away on IRL like the Pasternak thing came up immediately so I, I should have but um, I'm trying to think I, I don't think it did but I you know you would hear him talk about like not needing handlers and not needing people who are gonna tell him what to do and like I think he's trying to surround himself with a team that isn't afraid to give him criticism because he likes criticism and he likes this uh, this effort of like people working together to make something that's as perfect as possible as perfect as we, we could possibly make it but um you know he doesn't want people to pretend like uh they're helping him but then at least just from my perspective but then like helping him in a way of like avoiding certain problems right like i think he's going straight ahead full speed into whatever problem because he feels passionately about it and that's just what it is so i think you know when people try to swerve him out of it he's a, he's a little like reluctant for that but uh yeah i, I wish we talked more about the mk ultra maybe maybe hopefully next time did he ever say well, did he ever express any because uh, he, he, he expresses a lot of trepidation about elon musk <laughs> um, obviously, from what you wrote here in part one and two, he brings up the the uh, the the, uh, the, fi- the fact that he looks half Chinese. We even did a deep dive because then 4chan, of course, went off and said, "All right, we've got to make this work. We uh, and we we've got to work this out and see what is is there anything to this half Chinese thing uh, based on his Instagram post? Based on the Instagram <laughs> post, and dude, I, I we put together a a dive." Uh, compiled everything that the internet did yeah. onto my blog great. about how um, the plausible the how plausible it was that Elon his father his true father was Pol Pot oh wow I, I gotta say you listen you, wow. you kick around any any kind of thing I, I would have sent it to you <laughs> yeah please it, it's 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 out there but it's not totally nuts hey, anything's possible man so uh, that that's hilarious I like it's in the second piece but like I helped him write that Instagram post uh, we were sitting together <laughs> and just talking about it. And, I, and I, like five minutes into this conversation, I see that he's been asking me questions on like certain words to use. And I don't know what's happening until he's like, this is Instagram post we're going to do. I'm like, oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> that, you were sitting with him when he did that. I, I added words to it and like I edited it on his phone. That and, uh, is when he just put the white text up on the black mm-hmm, screen. Yeah. That's what started the whole, that started, mm-hmm. that started the he entire. He was talking about it the whole morning. Like this is the whole second story is like, him and I in church and Bible study wow. and in the car and like uh, when we're in church he's literally texting Elon like next to me being like I'm going to debate you in free speech like on camera I don't know if Elon got back to him but like so he is that day he was obviously thinking about Elon uh, so like we're, we'll be talking and just randomly he would be like man Elon I think he's half Chinese <laughs> uh, so, so yeah then it turns into this Instagram post uh, that just like it was hilarious to we were like two little kids like watching cartoons because we were just giddy we were laughing so hard and, like we were like who else could we throw into this thing because like it started with just the Elon's half Chinese thing but it ended with like we got Jay-Z in there because it was Jay-Z's birthday we got Zuckerberg in there uh, you know South African supermodels uh, Obama, you know, so it was like by the Dude, end, it was, it was crazy. You know what's, what's even crazier? Because here you are, you're at the genesis of this entire thing. Yeah. On the tail end of the thing, it's it's people like me right. who are sitting over here <laughs> talking about how, well, it could be, you know, Pol Pot could be his father, you know? So it's it's hilarious. I mean, we took the ball and ran with yeah, it, but no, still. Dude, with, literally within minutes, he was getting phone calls from people. Like, they're like, I think we cracked the code. I think we got it. Like, Aiden Ross is calling him, like, talking about it, and like, I tell I tell him I'm like you know you just gave a lot of writers like hack writers fifty like fifty bucks for writing an article about how they think this is probably hateful and within an hour there was multiple articles on that and uh, it had like a ridiculous amount of likes. Uh, well, it, that does not dispel any of my. It does not dispel any no. of my um, my what you would call my suspicions about cloning <laughs> yeah, and yeah, my yeah. theories about clones and any of that Good. stuff. No, but shouldn't. but just knowing the. 
knowing the genesis of that one Instagram post, yeah. that's interesting now. Yeah. Um, so okay, <laughs> so let's let's get down to the 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 crux of. I mean, there's, there's plenty more in there, and I, maybe people will will send in other questions throughout the throughout the night. But I want to wrap this up before we go to a break at eight o'clock, so that we can do other things in the second half and just get random with stuff. Um, then you on your second day, that was you went to church with him. Yeah. Yeah, was, you asked to go with him. Yeah, well, he offered it first uh, on our first interview. Like it came up, and it's funny because I, I think I willed that because I told Nancy, my wife, before I left, I'm like, I'm going to go to church with Kanye because I, uh, you know, I made a point years ago to write a positive review for his gospel album, which I love. Right, like I love gospel music. I always have. Um, I really like this stuff called the Sacred Heart music, which is from Alabama that Alan Lomax had these field recordings of. Um, so, I I made it a point of loving. You know, I wanted to go into Pitchfork.com, a, a place that was, you know, very horrible to Kanye. I was like, I'm going to make them write, say something good. So, you know, I did that years ago, and this kind of felt like the evolution of that story because like, here I am again, like trying to make sense of all this. But um, he he brought it up. And at the end of the interview, he was like, he brought it up again. And, you know, he had shared his number earlier in the interview because he wanted me to send him the Thomas Soul videos and the Sacred Heart music. Uh, so then yeah, he hits me up at night and I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's amazing. So, yeah, I, I show up in the morning uh, for church. He, he just walks right in. No mask. Where Where is it? Where's is, where is this church? What's the it's in L.A.? I honestly have no idea where I was like I ha I've never been out there. I, I didn't have a car. I just get in a lift and they take me. I couldn't even tell you where it was. What's the denomination? Because th uh, is there anything in particular? Because there's a lot of a lot of people. You know, that's have a good a, question. A lot of questions. A lot of suspicion about. You what could find it easily because it's all on TMZ. I, I should have actually looked at TMZ to get the. I, I I made it a point to not like say which church it was in the stories. I didn't want people like going there. But like it's clearly it's on TMZ. So I think you could probably see the signs, but. It seemed like just a Christian church, you know. Uh, it, I didn't seem Baptist. Uh, born, I, you know, it's born again. I wouldn't say that, honestly. I don't know because a lot. Of, this is a lot of the questions yeah. that people have That's who are question. still. The, I'll tell you, even me. I mean, yeah. you you are a longtime fan of Kanye West, and yeah. of course, you had all you had these two days with him, right? But I don't know him from a hole in the wall. Yeah. I, I pretty much just I know him from being famous, right? Um, and I also. I, I we've we've analyzed a lot of the the social impacts of his shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. So and, and of course that that ranges from good to <laughs> negative to neutral. Oh, it's all over. So, but for me, when it comes to big names like this who go through these amazing transitions, I am always just cautiously mm -hmm. optimistic about certain things especially if they're breaking programming right um i'm uh, and then everything else is just i'm always suspicious i'm always right. suspicious about uh, about religious um religious revival yep. i mean you see justin bieber going to weird congregations uh -huh. that, that don't look i mean it, yeah, things just weird. look yeah it looks weird it was weird no this church is it was very much like the kind I'm, I like going to where it's just very simple. Uh, I didn't notice anything like weird, you know, that because I've been going to like Baptist churches, uh, different types of Southern Baptist churches, uh, Assembly of God type churches, and uh, it wasn't like it wasn't Catholic or anything like that. It's just very simple. Like we just talked about worshiping Christ and and the idea of forgiveness. The idea of forgiveness has certainly like permeated everybody's minds because although no one directly said anything to him about it that weekend because it just happened, it, it came up like in the sermon in a roundabout way, you know? But I think he takes it very seriously. I, but I, I've been thinking that for years. If you just like if read his lyrics or like talking about that, you know, I think he, but even since before he became born again like he started with jesus walks like it's always been important to him i think it's just on a new level now um so yeah i, I think he takes it incredibly seriously um so as far as i can tell you know it, it means something to him and i think it bothers him that like clearly he's not with his family you know i i can't imagine that feeling um i think he obviously would love his family to be going to church with him but uh, does he does he see his children at all? Yeah, okay. from what I can tell, he he does see them. You know, there's, I was like around things that were happening. I was just like too personal. Like I wouldn't share in the story, but yeah, like I, mean, I see him like dealing with it, 
and it's rough um and i don't understand like whatever parameters they have in their relationship but he's definitely seeing them uh i'm sure it's just not as much as he would like i I think he obviously just wants his family together i i I was twisting i was twisting in my chair yesterday i was i was was home writing the show for uh, last night and lauren and the baby were were out for most of the day because they have to they had run errands and they have to babysit for uh, uh um um our niece and all that stuff and mm-hmm. you know i wasn't with them from maybe around 10 30 a.m until about 2 30 and mm-hmm. i was just you know i'm looking out the window like a dog waiting for their owner to oh, come back i was just i'm you know about it i so, mean leaving my family now in west virginia it's like not seeing them for any number of t- time is just but it's more than that too because when yeah. you think about this the people like this obvious d- d- uh, c- uh this government trained handler pasternak mm-hmm. who is the type that I'm sure is assigned to many people of great influence throughout entertainment. Yeah. That they are so comfortable throwing around the ability that they wield to um, turn them into a public case that, oh, well, they had to be institutionalized, they went nuts. You're going to be, you're going to be sedated and your children are gonna be taken away. And even when you're with them, you're gonna be so zonked out that yep. you're not even gonna be able to feel the joy yep. uh, of, of their presence. So disgusting. You know, th- that's a huge, that's a huge revelation right there. Yeah. As far as how the mechanics of this, this, this simulation yeah. really is held together. That's because- what I was thinking. Like, you know, I think the simulation used to operate in blood, right? We used to actually assassinate people. JFK, MLK, Malcolm X, right? Like these assassinations would happen. But then it's like they it, they realize it's just cheaper to character assassinate, um, and, or or just destroy your credibility through things like what you're talking about, you know, drugging them up, hospitalizing them, like the rest of this country. You know, we're we're so over drugged. I, so I saw somewhere recently. I don't know if it's true, uh, but it's like I think it was like seventy percent of people are on like at least two or three medications, and I, I witnessed that to a degree in the hospital recently when my wife had her uh, like an emergency appendix surgery, and they were the nurses and the doctors were they were all like we never see like a healthy normal person with like a, just an affliction and you look around it's just like they're like it's like a zombie apocalypse like mm-hmm. everyone's on there's overdoses to fentanyl because it's kind of like by a highway and the highways are great places for the fentanyl to come off and the hospital's right there so they're just inundated i mean the triage was in the hallway like there's no beds and it's just really like a, it literally sounded like a zombie apocalypse so we're all just so medicated, which is again talk speaks to what we're saying earlier, where people not paying attention. Like, how do you when you're so drugged up uh, anyway, yeah. right? So, then they take that and they do that to someone who's famous, and it's like they set this example with them, and they become a metaphor for the rest of us who are who are in that situation, but no one cares about. Um, and that that disturbs me, it disgusts me, and it makes me think of something that Ye told me in the in the story. Like, I, I was telling him because he keeps asking for advice. I'm like, all right, one thing you could do. Uh, when you do interviews, sometimes you just drop the word Tuskegee, and it's like we all you should like, you expect us all to know what it is. But like, if you really tell people with your platform what that is, like you will begin to like shatter everything because you'll open up people to something that I don't think a lot of people know about. You know, with the experiments with syphilis and stuff. So, you know, and and he said to me, yeah, America's like America's one big uh, Tuskegee, and I was like, yes, yes. 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 Thank it, you. <laughs> it, it, it's it's things like Tuskegee that I use I use to um, to set people down a, a path of of real enlightenment. When they say, well, "Okay, well, oh, okay, red, I, I need to red pill somebody," and I, yeah. I say, "Okay, well, do not go to the bigger conspiracies. Don't go to the bigger conspiracies. Yep. First thing we have to do is make sure that your trust, your trust in the authorities, mm-hmm. is forever destroyed." Yeah, that'll do it. That's all you have to Decades do. long. Yep. Decades long. And like you look at, for me, it actually, it wasn't even Tuskegee that broke me uh, many years ago. It was when uh, when Hillary was like the secretary and she apologized openly for what we did to Guatemala, which is basically the same thing as Tuskegee, where we in tandem with the Guatemalan government just secretly gave, uh, I think it was also syphilis to all these people in Guatemala. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, really? And I looked it up. I'm like, oh my Lord. Uh, and I... I thought I understood how evil we were in this government, and uh, it, that really did something to me. And then that led me to, you know, Tuskegee and lots of other things. It, it, it's these, it's this reason too that when the last few weeks have transpired with the 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 Timcast and then the the Infowars and then uh, the Gavin McGinnis talk was was great. Yeah, I was there for that. Um, I, I mean, yeah, that, that was, was that was pretty great. I, yeah. I've seen most of it now, and. 
that's the reason why I can watch stuff like that and well I'm I'm not very I don't get too flustered from controversial shit as it is right but uh, I can watch that stuff and be able to be a little bit more stunned at how everybody else around us really doesn't understand how 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 the hierarchy of evil has really played out in time you said it in the beginning uh, when people have ha they feel compelled to always put Adolf Hitler at the top of the at the top of the list right. as abject evil yeah. when it when the, the the Jewish Holocaust wasn't even the biggest Holocaust going on the biggest genocide going on in that war right you know what the Japanese did to Dude, the the rape of Nanking is one of the worst things you'll ever read about I mean it's <laughs> it's not even the worst genocide that happened in that war yeah so and then you have and then you talk about what was going on inside the United States government that actually allowed deliberately put uh, you know, uh, brought uh, Chiang Kai-shek mm -hmm. out of favor mm -hmm. and started um, su uh, supporting the rise of Mao, which right. then went to lead <laughs> on to 100 million dead. Yes. Right in there. Yep. Forget it, it, about... It's, it's a nonstop system of violence. Nonstop. And we are a part of it, right? Like, I mean, if I was on InfoWars with Ye, I told him when he said uh, Nazis good, did, good things, did good things too, I would have been, oh, yeah, the American government thought the same thing. Clearly. That's why we had paperclip. Right? Yeah, we obviously that's, we got NASA through that. Like, we literally we took, did that. We took their brain trust. Yes, it wasn't even like you know we we took their brain trust mm -hmm. and then we actually allied with their stay behind mm -hmm. uh, forces for mm -hmm. for uh, uh, Gladio. Yeah, so don't don't like spare me your moral authority with all this stuff because like you you are beholden to a government that you think is like this pristine thing that you trust with our lives like with you want this big government I'm talking to you as in like the leftists out there you you trust this like large government to you know do the best for us meanwhile like you and you're also the one who says punch a Nazi but you're you love your big government that did things like paperclip that did things like giving amnesty to unit 731 right when we went over there and discovered the the things we were the, that the Japanese were doing to the Chinese in those camps, you know, cutting them open, having them eat their own organs, you know, mm -hmm. raping the women and giving birth to those kids and experimenting with those children, like really demonic stuff. Um, we just went there and said, "Hey, we want this information. You have amnesty now." <laughs> so you should be thoroughly disturbed with these people. Yeah. Um, but when I when I say I have hope, you know, like the last two years, as bad as they were for the world. And here, and especially in New York, uh, we, we suffered through it. Uh, I see a lot of people starting to see through the facade that normally wouldn't have, you know, and they're like really questioning a lot of stuff. And they, some of them didn't even need us to talk to them about Tuskegee because they kind of lived through it, right? They're like, yeah, this is not, something doesn't feel right here. This is weird. Like, I don't agree with medical segregation. I don't agree with this forced vaccination stuff. I don't agree with lockdowns. I don't agree with taking away small businesses. I, I don't agree with leaving these big businesses open. You know, I don't get it. So in a way, I, you know, I've been telling people COVID was kind of a blessing. You know, as horrible as it was for a lot of people, uh, and you know, it wasn't fun. It opened up a lot of people's eyes. It did. Um, it, it it did. Uh, I we're 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 still going to be living with great great waves of terrible fallout though because oh, of it. trauma. Yeah. Uh, government overreach. You know, I, I there's a lot that has to be done. But I have been having lots of conversations, and this is just like my personal experience shouldn't dictate like you know some prescription for hope or or, or policy. But uh, I just keep having all these conversations with people, even in LA, with taxi drivers who are like, "Yeah, we're like wide awake now. Like we hate this government." <laughs> I'm like, "Thank God." Well, uh, ho well, that y I, I, it'd be nice to see. Be nice to see some um, s some greater I don't know demonstrations of that. I mean, I yeah. I say. You have to try. You have to find the silver linings in order to to just I don't know to cr put together some kind of a skeletal framework to build on. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, I wonder if like living in New York how it affects you now? Like I, when I was in New York, still I it, it, it seemed like the apocalypse, and now with like some distance and not coming here, and I don't know how it's been the last like nine months really because it's better than how it was. It's been pretty normal, right? So, but like those that first summer of lockdown, it was like. So bizarre. It was terrible. I mean, we so had, uh, and when I say normal, I mean <laughs> as far as being able to just comfortably walk into anywhere and not have yeah. to have wow <laughs> some kind of a piece of useless paper on your face. Yeah. But um, that first summer, 
aside from, of course, the fact that everybody would, would you know, take breaks from being scared inside to go and protest. Hmm. Um, yep. You know, because we had that. Every every town had at least five idiots that got together mm-hmm. to talk about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, slavery. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know what the hell is <laughs> fucking going on. Yeah. But for the most part, we're sitting, me and my friends, we're all sitting in the backyard uh, at my place and, you know, having barbecues and smoking cigars and just sitting around and talking while the skies were as quiet as they were on 9-11, mm-hmm. but for the entire year mm-hmm. because air travel was nothing. Yeah. So it, I that's when I, especially by the time we got to May and June and we realized what this was being used for, what we were being set up for with the election, that this was a slow motion 9-11. Uh-huh. And it's, yep. it, it really, I mean, it's, it's only starting to really slow down, but when is it going to get kicked back up again? There's yep. another uh, there's another event 201 that, that happened uh-huh. in October that we just learned about. Yeah, so, yeah. They, it, it's, it's going to go on. They're going to try to perpetuate this forever. Like they're surfing this wave of fear, you know, and, and it always pops back up around elections but like it's always there it's always just boiling now and there's a large population of people um who totally bought into it and i just think like we're severing from each other which is not good because i don't want that but i just i mean i know people who you know this is like on the flip side of the hope Uh, i know people who just didn't leave their house for like a year and they have kids (laughs) we didn't stop there, like I had like maybe a week or two of like being like, okay, I'm gonna take it real easy. I'm gonna put on the gloves. And my even before they were telling us to wear a mask, because like my wife was pregnant with our second kid, and I was like, I don't know what this is. But like two, three weeks into it, I was ordering pizza, and they came through and they're on the phone when I ordered. They're like, okay, it was like a drug deal. They're like, when when they arrive, you're gonna meet them here. You're gonna place the cash on this over there. They're gonna put the pizza over here. I'm like, this makes no sense. They're touching the cash with their bare hands. That I just had my bare hands on. No one is thinking this through. Um, so I'm done. And I don't care. And we had parties. We had kids parties. And um, we lived with my grandma at the time. Who uh, She was like 80, I want to say 84, 84. Had leukemia. Didn't care. You know, we were just living our lives. We had plenty of parties. And we had a great time. And the skies were beautiful. That was it. Mm-hmm. I, my, my wife was pregnant during 2020 as well. So, oh, wow. you know, we, we were we we're doing all the things w- with uh, that in mind. The baby was on the way. Yep. And so it wasn't only a, it was a the, the big thing for us was, all right, September. Baby's coming in September. Mm-hmm. Now we have to we have to do all I want to do. And she was agreed. All we wanted to do was get in and out of that hospital as quick as possible. Did they let you in? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. We, we had good. to switch hospitals. Okay. Yeah, because the first hospital in New York was they were going to have me do, you know, tests to even get in there. Uh-uh. They were going to keep me separated from her for a certain amount of time. Mm-mm. And then they wouldn't let her leave unless the baby had certain cu- couple. Not not because the vaccines weren't out yet. Right. Yeah. But they wouldn't let her leave until the baby had s- certain medications given. Mm. So, nope. So we went to a, uh, a Connecticut hospital. Oh, and, wow. Good for you. And yeah. Oh, we switched. Wow. We dropped our midwives wow. and everything. Two weeks before the baby was born. Hey, man, you had to. You had to. You made the right decision. Two weeks. We lucked out because we, we were in a hospital near here, um, and we lucked out. It was all good. I was prepared to handcuff myself to my wife. There was no way. I was Because I deliver those kids. Like I, I literally catch them. I cut the umbilical cord. You know, and like my, the, This is crazy. But like the umbilical cord was around my daughter's neck, like the one we had here. And just, just cut it and fine. It's like you don't even think about it too much. It's like so much. You're just like, oh, yeah, I do it. But we had a great time. The nurses didn't care. We didn't wear masks. Um, it was weird trying to leave. It was like, you can't leave more than once. I'm like, why? Yes. Why? I, I made friends with a, a police officer, and I said, I said, listen, man, I, I've been upstairs for like two days. Can I just go outside and grab a little bit of air? This was after the hospital was closed. He said, okay, no, no problem. Nice. So I, I got that down. But uh, I remember at that, you know, we, we I we pulled Lauren's um, oh yeah his her uh, mask down below her chin yeah during because they what? were they were trying to get her crazy and I know that they probably succeeded with some women oh sure. to keep sure. the mask on during w- during pushing yeah. yeah yeah dude I I had enough like in New York like uh, our kids our, our son was in daycare like that summer like that first like big lockdown summer and it was an outdoor daycare but like not for covid it just always was and that's why we went there it was like for nature and stuff the the teachers there were just your typical like you know the libs of tiktok in real life oh boy and it was like that was already like okay this can't happen much longer 
And then, they, and then the the final straw was uh, they had them wear the masks outside, and I it was like you are waterboarding these kids through their masks because they're you know water seeping into their mouth they're breathing it in you are literally torturing them they didn't see a problem with it so we were just like yeah we're out of here you know because they're fucking stupid they're beyond stupid that's why they they have no there's there's no brain waves it's just not working that's why i stopped unfortunately i i I don't know how much time i would have had the last two years but i my last year i coached I coached uh, Little League for 15 or 16 years, mm. starting in my junior year uh, at Manhattanville mm-hmm. until the end of 2019 season. Mm-hmm. And 2020, I was not going to be outside <laughs> with 13 children with masks on, no. out running around outside. Yeah, no way. You know? No uh, way. But, so we'll see what happens when Aurora is ready to start playing. Because I, It's I, a great I, name. Yeah. yeah. Awesome name. Well, thank you so yeah. much. What are your children's names? Morgan and Poppy. Wonderful. Yeah. I know one other poppy. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Awesome. Very nice. Yeah. Um, you know, with with that being said, masks, the last thing I'll ask, um, because people obviously have to just go read part one and two of, of this, uh, your two days with Ye, but did Kanye have the mask on the entire time with you? Not the, once. The, the black sackcloth? Not once. Uh, I was I was worried. I was like, who am I going to want? What, what Ye am I getting? Hostile? Happy mask, no mask, uh, but yeah. Right when I, right when I walked up to him for the first time, he immediately like remembered our conversation on Monday. He was all smiling, and uh, it was great. So yeah, I, I only saw him in the mask for maybe four minutes, and that was outside of the church when a fan wanted a photo. Hmm. And then after that, it was not. I think I, for him, I think it's just like an armor. You know, I think he's. Uh, and this is just like again, like my like hyper obsessive like insight into like following him through the ages but he wore a mask during like the Yeezus era when he was like at an- on another type of war campaign so it's like when I see the mask now I'm like connecting it to that which is when he also wore the confederate flag to reclaim a symbol so it's like this is just to me like an evolution of that right it's the same thing so I, I don't think he I, I only think he wears it outside or on certain interviews and I think since mine was off camera it didn't matter so I was I'd hope I hope I was getting more of like a true insight into him. What do you think? And this will be my last question on this before we go to intermission. What do you think? We have um, we have speculated a lot about this campaigning for president. Mm-hmm. I, from a practical standpoint, I don't see how he could win the White House ever Mm -hmm. i don't even care about those elections too much anymore anyway um but as we were speculating together a couple of weeks ago that it wouldn't be beyond the the realm of consideration that the goal is something much bigger than actually actually winning and attaining an office that there is something you get any kind of insight as to what this actually could be or is he really talking about the office of the presidency i mean he's for real talking about the office of the presidency like he is for real talking about it you know i've i've seen it it's not a joke he is one billion percent interested in it but i will say like i think at the very least a campaign like his if he starts to really like expand on this idea of this radical love that he's doing it will cause a lot of um hope to spread you know i think like with his platform and being you know whether or not people even take him seriously doesn't even matter because it's like you're not going to change a lot of people's opinions uh well maybe you have i've heard from some interesting readers who have changed their minds but um you know i think it for him is like if i can just spread the word of god and i can talk about hope and joy and forgiveness and i'm winning but he is i mean he told me straight up like i was like do you see yourself in the white house he's like "Uh, i will be in the white house which is like it sounds you know like just ego but um I've just seen him say that in other interviews about things that then they do happen. So it's like, you should be scared (laughs) because like if he's saying it and he really is going to put his mind to it, he'll do it. I mean, he did it when he was like a producer. People told him he can't be a rapper. And I know this is different than being the president, but he also looks at Trump as like this amazing figure who like, as like an example of like, this guy could do it, then I can do it. Um, But like, you know, rapper to like pop artist and then, uh, you know, shoe designer, all these things where it's like, whether you like those things or not, he did succeed in them in the face of rejection. So when I see people being like, this is not real or, or mocking it, I'm like, I get it. But I would I would not discount it because the more you do that, 
the more you're going to make him do it and he will succeed at it just out of basic pattern recognition and i know it's insane to think of the white house but like at this point what does it even like what does it even matter anymore look at what we've had we have a corpse right now as a president yeah we, we, trump was there last you know it's like it, it this isn't beyond the realm of reason uh it it might sound like that but it's like we've had hollywood stars as presidents and in the future like they won't think of him the same way we do and maybe they will but like we we are living it now so it seems absurd but uh i don't know he seems dead set on it so it's possible that hindsight being that you're right that hindsight is always 2020 um and for something like this that hindsight would only be available to i don't know three generations from now it would uh you would hope that all of the emotional the emotional attachment then we would be a little bit more dispassionate about things but hey then again look at how passionate we still are about adolf hitler right. so he's <laughs> he's trying to neutralize that a little bit yeah we'll see how well he does we're gonna come back and i just want to take some uh Maybe some calls and some thoughts and questions from the audience in the super chats, and then we'll get into some just regular roundtable weird stuff and and uh, and and just dip into your more general interests. All right. Awesome. All right, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, anybody. In fact, please go and share and reshare those live links because we got another forty-five minutes to go. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four fifths of its population. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, V. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress, and deify science. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Welcome to Intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Yeah, Intermission. Now entering 
quite frankly. 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 We all support quite frankly. Quite frankly. Let's go, Brandon. Not quite. Quite frankly in Roma, Italia. I really like you. You're very smart. So everybody watch. Quite frankly. With Frank. Quite frankly. How dare you? We're here back at the Quite Frankly Cafe, and we're just hanging out. We are hanging out, having a good time, and um, Shane Cashman is here. Yo. He is here, and we had a, man. What a great, great first half. Yeah. What and what a what in it's surreal journey that must have been for you. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to go out there on an assignment, and it's a big assignment. It's another thing for somebody to go out. Th- That'd be like if somebody said, Frank, uh, or or like substitute you for me and Kanye West for like I don't know James Hetfield from Metallica, <laughs> and and I think who I also love. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's something like that, and that it was it was supreme. Like you feel like you're being carried by God. Like it was like I always think of Brian Wilson's another person who I really do like admire his music. Like the Beach Boys. And speaking of childbirth, every so when my both my kids were born, I play the same song as they're being born, and that's God only knows because it's my favorite song of all time. Mm. Uh, and Brian Wilson talks about how music is a vessel for God and music is God's voice. Um, so I was thinking about him and like the way like Brian says like. Uh, the voice of God goes through him and that's how he finds his harmonies. And I was just like, I'm surfing harmonies right now, you know, getting to yay. And, uh, it just felt it, it honestly, if I felt about it too much, my brain started to malfunction. Cause it was like, it's too real. It was just too much. Um, and I'm like, I'm always the, I was always the person defending this guy, even like for ridiculous things. I mean, this is, I think the most ridiculous that it's been, but so it's just like, what are the odds, man? Yeah, um, what are the odds? I was, I feel like I was just meant to be placed there at this time, and uh, and he took me seriously, which I, I I really do appreciate. So, and I think that's why I got the second day. You know, I didn't expect that. The second day was a real blessing. Obviously, it was an authentic experience for everybody. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's see here. We're good. Rumble. We have a wonderful crowd on Rumble. A very cozy crowd on Theta and on Rockfin. Amazing crowd on YouTube and on D Live and Foxhole. Awesome. Everybody together. Uh, Poopy just wrote in. This is Poopy Butthole, by the way. Oh, what's up, Poopy Butthole? Poopy says, Shane, did the half Chinese thing seem like a complete fabrication and a joke to Kanye, or did he seem like he actually knew something when creating the Insta post? I think it's probably both. <laughs> I think he probably thinks it, but it was also a troll, if that makes sense. Okay. I think he there was something to it, and he's looking at pictures. He's like, something's clicking in his brain, and he, there's something there. But he also knew it would be a troll, you know? So I, I, I think uh, multiple things are happening in his head at once. He also, that, he two, also knew two. people like me would, would have fun uh, going through all the 4chan yes. threads that would go that yes. would be popped up. He, he said, like, people in the blogs, the trolls, the Redditors, he said to me um, that they're the smartest people on Earth. And I was like, yes, <laughs> it's <laughs> clearly. It, it, I mean, you see the the most the two extremes. There's either completely <laughs> brain, brain. You see the brain dead. You see the shill, yeah. the, the the shill slide threads and all. And yeah. then you see intellect. Yeah, autists. It's just, I yeah. mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, it's great. It's incredible. Uh, Jane Jones. Jane Jones says, uh, "Merry Christmas, Frank, Lauren, and Aurora. Will you please show the dugout mug? The dugout mug, Ken." had personalized for you on your show. He doesn't think you like it. Oh, I love it. It's at home. <laughs> I I uh I was given this this mug. I forget what it was. It was this sometime this year, maybe for my birthday or maybe I don't know. But it's a uh, it's a hollowed out baseball bat. The the barrel of a baseball bat that is a mug. Oh, that's awesome. It's it's incredible. Yeah, you know it's good if you brought it home. Oh yeah, I leave, yeah I, I leave it there. Yeah, that's great. That's so cool. And I haven't even used it yet. I put it on display. Yeah, yeah, right. Cuz yeah. I, I think I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to 
Has I don't want to put liquid inside. You know, yeah. I don't know. Obviously, it's made for that. Yeah. But it's 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 like a. I don't know. It's you really, want to preserve it. Absolutely. Well, hey, uh, Ken, I love it. Just want to let you know. <laughs> and uh, also, a happy birthday to Jane Jones. Oh, happy birthday. There you go. That's it. Um, Stostube, thank you so much. And Albert Frederick, an hour ago, says, Frank, dude, you have to say happy birthday to my stunningly beautiful, amazingly attuned, mysteriously mischievous, hauntingly alluring, very low maintenance, and willing to help me hide a body if necessary soulmate, Empress Lisa Frederick. And she cooks. Oh, Lisa, it's good to know that you're still out there and you're still putting up with Al, 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 uh, Albert. You know, happy birthday, Lisa. That's yes. a ride or die. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Boys Blanc says Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Sean Joe, thank you. Boys Blanc again. Porpoiseful, thank you. Uh, Sadie Edwards said, "Can you send a shout out to Foundering One on Twitter?" Uh, bass tweeter, even more bass musician. Well, there you have it. I can uh, I can only go by what she, they say. <laughs> I don't know. Boys Monk again. Rise of Tires says, loving this so far. Are either of you guys familiar with the Blackwell Ghost series? Paradigm shifting stuff. Ten out of ten. I'm not. What? Uh, yeah, uh, Adrian, you got to send me a little bit more on that Blackwell Ghost series. I want to know mm -hmm. about it. Sounds cool. Ranger Billy says, Shane's on point. Thank you. Captain Flint and Paulie sent cookies and phones. Thank you guys so much for your gifts. All right, so then let me let me jump into this. I have a few things here. Um, now, from you on your other journeys, you recently did a, a, a trip to the South to investigate the ghosts of the Civil War. <laughs> now, this is something I wanted to explore uh, a lot, a, a lot over the course of the holidays, uh, the uh, the fall holidays. That is haunted battlefields. Mm. I wanted to talk about high altitude hauntings because I heard people talk about that once before on planes or just That's high altitude. But as far as battlefield haunted battlefields, mm -hmm. what did you learn about that? I think Georgia, but all places are particularly haunted by trauma. And I think the ghosts are attached to the trauma. Georgia in particular because of the March of the Sea and how much destruction there was um, after the war. But even, you know, before that, uh, in, in this town, Washington, Georgia, where I did the story, um, one of the bloodiest battles of the revolution was there too. And that battlefield is just on a dark vibe. Uh, so much so that we became friendly with witches who go there to charge their crystals at night on a full moon. Wow. And they believe that the the blood from the battle uh, lifts up into their crystals and out through the moon. Um, <laughs> and so. this is for this is from a, a battle which I guess would be considered to them as a sacrifice from yes. over two hundred yeah, years ago. It's blood magic. Yeah, like they're they're way into it, you know, and it's not good stuff, you know, there's a total bad vibe, but um, they they believe in that. And so, like, I went down there just to just because I got an email from this guy who's now my friend, Clint, who lives in this town. And he was like, you might be interested in the story of the lost gold. I grew up in West Point. I love the Civil War, like the stories, not the war. And uh, I was like, sure, that sounds like fun. So Tim sent me down there in October and it just turned into like within my first three days no i'm sorry i'll just go within my first two hours i saw a woman run screaming out of a building because the ghosts were too loud she's a realtor and uh this is in washington georgia <laughs> washington georgia so i like immediately knew like this isn't going to be an article and i think there's a lot more here because this place is possessed uh it's in the middle of nowhere it's basically where the civil war ended in a way like not like appomattox but like I guess to put it better, this is where the Confederacy ended. You know, Jefferson Davis dissolved the Confederacy in this town. And the gold was with him. The gold and Davis and his cabinet left Richmond at the end of the war when Richmond was burning. The Confederates burned it themselves, so the Union didn't. And it was like this, there's crazy accounts you can read of Confederates who were there saying it was like demons howling in the fires. They were, they were dumping liquor out of the buildings so no one would get drunk, but they were taking their hats and scooping it up from the gutters. Then there was two trains leaving, one with Jefferson and his cabinet, the other with the gold. They both went eventually to, to Washington, Georgia, but it took a crazy route there. And that's um, when Jefferson got, got caught. 
on that in Wa- outside of Washington. Yeah. It was it was I forget the name of the town, but it was after being in, in Washington, Georgia. Yeah, it was a little bit after that he got caught and then brought back to Richmond. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it was just crazy. I, I think war trauma it instills a type of possession in the land. Like the land itself is traumatized. And whether you not want to call, you want to call it ghosts or what demons, uh, something is happening in those places, and people, certain people are reacting to them more than others. I think certain people are are more like attuned to certain things, children perhaps, and like this lady I was telling you about. You know, I don't personally have a lot of experiences like that either. I do have one ridiculous one that's you know I'll never forget. It has nothing to do with Georgia, but I was like something's going on here. You know, there's possessed dolls. There's witches everywhere for some reason. Uh, <laughs> New, upstate New York, I keep reading. I keep keep reading it, and when I say upstate, I'm talking about Putnam Valley and up. Right. That there's a lot of new covens that are popping up. Bro- Brooklyn, New York. It was during 2016 mm-hmm. when the when the election was really r- ramping up. Yeah. We were learning a lot about these covens of of witches that were getting together in little consignment shops in brooklyn yep. that were trying to cast hexes on oh, donald yeah. trump and then of course on every last I one i saw of it his... all around new paltz oh really oh yeah yeah new paltz oh man <laughs> we, that new paltz is that's another place where the band we, we would go up there to play cabaloosas cabaloosas yes yes yeah all the time dude and that was another one of those we're playing to 15 people yep. and or less places but it was we great. must have crossed paths we had to have. Yeah. <laughs> Shane was in a, a band as well. We were talking about it beforehand. And we were all playing at the same damn time, yeah. at the same venues. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, the Cabo loses. That was a yeah. that was a great weekend. And Snugs was down the road. I don't know if you played Snugs. But no. It was an even smaller bar, if you can imagine that. Great time. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, uh, yeah, I saw a lot of witches and a lot of witches in Georgia. And uh, no gold. <laughs> Everyone there is looking for it. I mean, there's like a whole economy of gold there. Like, everybody wants the gold. And, uh you know so like people were threatening my life because i was like asking too many questions i think there was two times i had my life threatened down there is is this what so i was going to ask you what what it was the most uh scared you've ever been on assignment because i heard that you were followed out of washington mm-hmm. georgia i have to imagine being followed is off-putting but what's the most uh i guess the the most i get scared you've ever been on assignment like yeah. where where the actual the actual content is making you uneasy although i had like the threats in Georgia and they were really mad. It was like, I don't think this person is really going to do anything. Uh, I think the, the, the craziest I felt was during the long Island serial killer when, uh, and that's in the first inverted world book. I, I come upon a website called utopia guide. Now, whoever finds this, I'm not endorsing this website and, uh, tread carefully. Uh, it's, been in existence since like 2000 you know before yelp because i call it like the yelp of hookers in long island um but it's before yelp so yelp is kind of like utopia guide uh and through utopia guide you could go through that website and what they do is they these men in long island rate the women and some of them it's just like okay you know they have a whole rating system and it's just like all right it's gross but it's just like just dudes being gross however there are some dudes who are insanely violent and say horrible things. And you can you can go back to even like literally 9-11, watch them raiding women while also finding out 9-11 is happening. It's wild. So I found this one person in that website. And uh, you have to know, though, like at the time when I found this, I had been so involved in the story and the paranoia of everyone involved that were like everyone's finding out where everyone lives and like even you just going to a website puts like a target on your head so like this is like at the end of that where people have literally left states because they've they've been threatened so much so like that's in my mind when i find utopia guide and i find this guy who's saying horrible horrible violent things that he does to women and hey it might just be someone just trolling just writing stories but it was just so real to me and i think i have a pretty good radar of when people are trolling me or not especially after like 10 years of watching students write and just being on the internet all the time like this is there was something very real to it so i remember like calling trying to call the website that owned utopia guide or whatever domain but it was listed as the rock of gibraltar so it was obviously fake Mm. um 
and through that i called the fbi and like i just felt like i was getting like random phone calls that might have not had anything to do with it right it could have just been who knows what yeah. but there were these private numbers happening and i was so deeply in the paranoia it's like funny in retrospect it like even saying it, it sounds like oh yeah well you shouldn't have been scared but i was out of my mind of like they're coming for me now you know i'm like i've been going to long island i've been walking where the bodies have been found multiple times i go to this guy's house who might be a suspect and then it ends you know with me coming upon this like utopia guide thing so it's just like the weight was crushing me Jeez. and i felt like a fear of like i mean just to think of like for those who don't know the long island serial killer whoever it is or or group of people because who knows what at this point they have been operating for years right and like they found a mutilated torso in Mannersville, Long Island in like the 90s and no one knew who, who it belonged to and that torso was who knows but it was found I mean we know this it was found down the road from I think Joel Rifkin I forget which one one of the serial killers who got in trouble for other people but not that torso right so he goes to jail for killing prostitutes um, we still don't know who did the torso in Mannersville down the road from you gotta look up the name again. I think it might be Rifkin. And then 20 years later, in Gilgo Beach, where the Long Island serial killer thing really starts, because we find like a graveyard of bodies lined up on the on the beach, they find a pair of hands that match the torso from 20 years earlier. So you're like, it's just so steeped in paranoia and and evil, uh, and like that place, like this time of year, because I kind of I started I started reporting on it in the winter. So it's so desolate. It's so scary out there in the, at the nighttime. You just, you and the surf and knowing like at some point there was a man or a group of people who pulled on the sh over on the shoulder of the road and dragged out these bodies in burlap sacks and like lined them up. Yeah. You know, and who knows how long they were even in wherever they were. Right. Um, so like all that's happening. And then it like, we find Utopia Guide and we see someone who's like, it's Long Island, it's prostitutes, it's insane violence like fetishized violence and yeah and then the fbi and i'm like frantic the weird phone calls i'm like out of my mind so much i'm going to use pay phones to make certain phone calls now because i don't want them to find me i'm like t like trying to like I, there's probably no one following me right like i'm just filled with paranoia at this point but that was uh that that is my long answer that's for the craziest that's what i'm talking felt. about with the subject matter yeah i mean there's there's nights obviously i'm not hot on the trail or anything like that <laughs> but there's some there's there's nights that i've you know for years now the, the first studio this studio mm -hmm. that i'll leave here and i'll you know i'll, I'll be given you know, I'll you know situational oh, yeah. awareness just because you just don't know. You don't know, and it's it, it's usually and most of the time mm -hmm. absolutely nothing. Right, but there's just this thing brewing inside of you. Yep. that's just it's uh, just like we know too much, right? We know like what people are capable of, and the, and then as you become a parent, like you even know like you have to now shield your your kids from all of this evil, and you're you're even more aware of it. You know, uh, so it, for me, it only like. I don't say the paranoia got worse, but my distrust of everything got worse for sure. So, yeah. So I, I can just imagine the opposite of the, the exhilaration of going out mm -hmm. to L.A. to do mm -hmm. what you just did yeah. compared to chasing ghosts. But yeah. aside from that, yeah. going off into Georgia and other places and, and doing the you know UFO pieces, mm -hmm. um, anything that has to do with uh, simulation theory mm -hmm. or any of that. Yeah. That's stuff again, like we said in the beginning, this is stuff that we need right now so much, even if it pans out and there's there's great debate that goes on and it seems like those who are on the side of this is all bullshit are presenting a lot more of a compelling argument. The fact that we are engaged in something that's that has stimulated our imagination, mm -hmm. that's what the, that's what is so I think important about conspiracy theory yeah. even though i hate using that buzzword created by right. the cia yep. but that right there it becomes an, an exercise in not only discernment but in in dialectic mm -hmm. and everything else yep. and uh and and you know more often than not you're, you're in a different place than where you started yeah and it makes you appreciate your life more yeah like a lot more like everything's so precious um every time is so fleeting everything is beautiful uh, but there is a lot of darkness out there and the more we talk about it the more you expose it i think the light can destroy it how you said uh, i see over here that you met a man who claims to know a reptilian human hybrid <laughs> 
Stan the man. <laughs> so this is the day I actually went to the Georgia Guidestones before they exploded. Uh, I was there like a month or two before. Okay. Uh, and I'd never been. And they, they're they just outside of the town, Washington, Georgia. So me and my buddy Clint went up there. That was a whole other experience. You know, talking to the guy. We randomly were there when the guy was cleaning them. And he told us about all the sacrifice stories that happened at the Guidestones. People cutting chickens' heads off. All this wild stuff. Wow. Uh, scattering the bones. People getting married there. All that. So after that, we were hit up by, we become friendly with some like cops out there, which felt like ne it needed to happen just for like the possible need of protection because of the death threats. Um, because like it, yeah, there were people who were really upset, you know, because everyone wants to find the gold. And if it's me, this Yankee, you know, coming in from New York, look like a carpetbagger, you know, I'm going to take their gold. Uh, so they got a little upset. So I became friendly with the cops, and it turned out on the way back from the Guidestones, it was one of them having like a retirement party at a Mexican restaurant. I'm like, perfect, that's my favorite food. So let's go. So we, we had a bunch of margaritas, uh, and I meet Stan the Man. Stan the Man is from Florida, and he was in Washington because he was he's a truck driver, and he was delivering a truck for Dollar General. And he got stuck in traffic because there was a bad accident, and it just so happened that the cop that let him through was one of the cops at the party. And then we all just like randomly met each other later on at the Mexican restaurant. So he like stand the man knew the cop. And then for whatever reason, uh, I don't know what I said, something about darkness, probably that he was like, I'm talking to this guy now. And he like, so we've had a, a few margaritas at this point, And he's telling me about like when he was in Hollywood trying to make it, he was telling me about going to like eyes wide shut type parties. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm not feeling this. You know, he's a, a good Christian man. He knew immediately, uh, this is evil. Um, so he was like, but I had a good friend out there, he said. And we were just chilling one night, drinking. And all of a sudden, he saw his eyelids, like, or maybe it was like this. And he was like, what was that? And his friend was like, nothing. And then it happened again, like, and he was like, what are you? You know? And his friend was like, he took his hand, he said, and just started crushing it. Like, like they're like they were shaking hands, but he was just like super strong, crushing like a, it like a vice. Yeah, and like <clears throat> he made his eyelids do it again, but like that time it looked like it was on purpose. And uh, you know, he is certain now that that is like a lizard, lizard person, uh, and he's like one billion percent believes it. Uh, and he was telling and me, he, how, like, and he's a he's a sober man. I mean, no, uh, he's we were drinking margaritas, and he was drinking at the time of that story, so he's not oh. a sober man. But uh, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that aside, because I've seen things. Uh, oh yeah, no, yeah, same. But that aside, like his story was so compelling, and uh, he could just be a good storyteller. But there was something in him, like on the verge of tears, where he was like, "I need to tell someone this," and like I, whatever I said about paranormal stuff, like. It like allowed him to feel comfortable, I think, to tell me the story that he probably doesn't tell a lot of people. Um, and he told me that. So he believes, you know, like I do, that darkness is everywhere and we're constantly fighting it. He also believes that he's met some lizard people and that they're, uh, they, they say they've sent him letters in the mail afterwards telling him, like, if you don't say anything to anyone about this, you know, we can make your life perfect. You're like giving him like his dreams come true, like whatever he wanted in Hollywood to be an actor. Right. But he knew like that's kind of like, you know, selling your soul. So, yeah. I, I well, <laughs> I, I, I don't have the authority to tell the story I know of a friend of ours uh, who is very well established in the in the music industry and 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 is also a devout Christian. And was asked to, asked to come by to audition to fill in on vocals for a pretty popular band, and um, in doing so, he showed up with a with a friend to this one house at a, an assigned time and place, and it was like the you know password at the door kind of a thing. His friend said, "Don't worry, you go ahead. I'll just stay here." Mm. And uh, we got in. When he got in, he saw the orgies, the the the. The porn and pentagrams projected on the walls right. and things going on there, and he he, he just graciously bowed out. Said, "Sorry, I don't I don't think I." Yep. And and at that point, it was um, almost like, uh, without saying it, you better not say anything. Yeah, yeah. Get the hell out, dude. Those things are out there, like clearly, you know. So that's that's the other thing. If they're not they're not um, they're not unconnected. Yeah. In in many ways, they're not unconnected. Everything is very connected, and and the fact that that this is so vehemently denied is what makes it all the more 
compelling to people like me and I'm sure right. you. Oh, yeah. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been to the American Southwest, those deserts out there? I haven't. Okay. I well, really want. I'm going I, to Phoenix next week, so do, maybe I can make who a way are you, out there. Are, are you, who are you meeting? Uh, we are going out with Tim Cast for the Turning Point thing. Okay. Well, I yeah. have somebody that you have to look up when you're out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. He's, a, he's a tour guide okay. but he, uh, and, a, and a cult specialist. Ooh. Oh. Oh, uh, he, he th- this guy, his name is Corey Daniel. Okay. I'm going to tell you all about him. Cool. And I'm going to introduce you guys. He's. Uh, you're going to get a great tour if you go out there. You ask him about it. But he, he also, he's met a skinwalker before. Really? But you want to talk to somebody about portals in the woods? and lost yes. gold and all that the the the, uh, the the flying dutchman not the flying dutchman the uh the what's it called the the damn it the ship no it's the dutchman the something dutchman yeah I can't uh, anyway we're talking about apache gold and all that right yeah you I love wanna... that stuff all right yeah, yeah I, i'd love to talk to so him. you're gonna be in phoenix yeah. already yeah perfect yeah I so can't wait, <laughs> that's I'm it. looking forward to it. I've never been out there. But I'm really excited. No, neither have I. I've uh, flown over the, the 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 general vicinity on my way to Anaheim the five times that I've been there, but right. not a lot of it. Not a lot of exploring like I I'd like to. Yeah. But and then the way it is now with the baby and I, I feel like I just got to put them in the car and do a lot of driving. That's what we do. I, when we're if we're going out as a family, it's a drive. I feel more in control that way. Exactly. You know? Like the airports are just insane to begin with, but um, I like to be able to, we can stop, we can get some food, we can chill, we can stretch. Look, like I was raised by parents who, you know, would would travel with horses up and down the East Coast, like because they were harness racers. So they, when they had me and my two little sisters, they kind of treated us like harness horses going up and down the East Coast. So we would just nonstop drive from New York to Florida. And I tried doing that to my son when he was like six months and I broke him. Like literally we got to North Carolina like halfway there and I took him out of his car seat at the hotel and he was like stuck in the position of like the car seat. And I was like, oh God, what did I do to this kid? I'm like, you better be ready in the morning because mom is going to kill me. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, we can take stops now. My kids are not harness horses. Uh, it's better, but I much, much prefer the, the road. And like you get a, a better sense of your country on the road. You know, if you just fly over it, you just... It's just, you just get CNN level like idea of the world, you know. Yeah, I no. want to see the signs and all that stuff. Right, right, and, I, and that's and that's what I've gotten a lot out of the last couple of years. The little things, wherever we would go, we we, we I haven't been on a plane in since 2019. I I don't yes. know when the hell it was, but um, it, oh oh, it was the weekend that Roger Stone was raided. Oh wow, no way! It was it was late January January 2019. Yeah. Okay. That's that's when that it was because I was at NAM convention in, in Anaheim. Oh cool! But uh, oh, it's the Lost Dutchman. Oh okay, cool, Lost cool. Dutchman. Yeah, yeah. It's that. See, I got that. We, we were doing a lot of that over the uh, over the the fall, and it still is the fall. The hell am I talking about? Fall for another week. Yeah. Ish. Um, what was it going to ask you? Um, oh, I want to do some of these these things with you i'm gonna take a really quick break very very quick we're gonna come back and i have a couple of these artifact the uh these articles i think that you'd be cool interested in so don't go anywhere ladies and gentlemen we'll be right back we're gonna be taking this one home right now with shane cashman brb brain flexibility with me and reach your full potential in just under 10 days quite frankly uh you know contributed to the death of seven million people because the funding of gain of function uh, experiments in the Wuhan lab. You're listening to Quite Frankly. Protect feminism or low gas prices? Oh, I'm always about lowering the gas prices for sure. Why? Absolutely. Uh, well, I think feminism is a demonic movement created by Satan to emasculate men, to get them out of the biblical order that God created. Um, and I don't even drive like a gas powered car. I drive a Tesla. I just don't like feminism. So it's cringe. <laughs> Did you get a chance to meet with the royal family? And if not, how was it like having them there in the building? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> the Prince and Princess of Wales. Oh, no, I did not. I'm only familiar with one royal family. I don't know too much about that one. Thank you. But I'm glad they're hopefully they're Celtic fans. Yeah, thank you. All right. 
Yes, feminism is a demonic uh, movement, and oh, and very yeah. cringe. Yeah, it's it's rough. I so many students I can think of at Manhattanville who were infected with it, and uh, oh, man, I'll never forget one of my first. You know, the first day of class when you go around introduce yourself. Yeah, that whole thing. We were doing that, and uh, the last girl to go was like, you could tell she was like only like reading tumblr and lived on a cul-de-sac her whole life <laughs> and had like all the pins on her on her hat for you know whatever stupid alphabet organizations you want to call and uh it was her turn to introduce herself so she did looks at me in front of the whole class and goes and i will never learn anything from a white man <laughs> She's a little white girl, too. I'm like, okay. Wait a second. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In it's, the library. In the, if you ever had the classroom in the library, the big room in the library yeah. uh, with the big table, right in there. And uh, I was like, you know, obviously in my head I was like, man, this, this is stupid, stupid girl. But I, I made it my goal to change her mind. This was the out. first day. First day. That's how she introduced herself. I will never learn anything from a white yeah. man. It's like, good for you. <laughs> what a rebel. <laughs> well, Why did you show up to class when you realize? <laughs> right. Why are you here? Why do you leave your house? Uh, but I, I, I didn't want to lead with hate. I was like, I could have, oh man, I was so like, ugh. But I was like, I'll just, I'll just prove her wrong, right? Like, I'll just do it. And like, honestly, I think by the end of the class, she took me seriously. And I hope she's doing fine. <laughs> I, I hope so too, because that is a, a really debilitating way to try to live. A, can you imagine, I, I, I try to imagine it all the time because we see that kind of thing on display a lot. Yeah. I can't imagine going out into the world and, and having an easy time just do like every everything is slight. You, as the moral authoritarian, you think you're the high ground, and so like, but you are really operating in resentment, and your soul will decay from that. So, I don't know how long it could like live, you know, in a person. I do see a lot of people who are like, they were that way for a while, and it just doesn't sustain itself. I mean, some people could do it forever, but I see a lot of people just be like, yeah, that was so much hate. Like I, I was projecting cause it's kind of just rooted in self-loathing. That's yeah. what it really is. They, yeah. they hate themselves. So then they hate everything, but they, they, you know, wear a mask of moral authority of moral authority. It's um, a dangerous thing. Yeah. Uh, especially for all the Nazi bastards out there. They, they don't really see the, the parallel at all. They become, they become what they hate. They literally almost always they become, become they worse. Hate. They become worse yeah. than what they hate. That's yeah. that's the that's the final insult. Oh, yeah, uh, dude, I had people literally telling me. So I wrote this book uh, called "The Fucking Lunatic," and it's about all my. It's literally all my debates I had online during lockdown, and post lockdown about medical segregation, and it was just like me saying something that I thought was logical, and people fighting me, and I turned it into a script. And uh, I had one friend tell me like. I was like, so you're definitely okay with medical segregation, even though like a majority of the people who are unvaccinated in New York City happen to be black, and you were just marching for them last year. And he was like, yes. I was like, holy crap, dude! Like you are filled with hate. You're filled with hate. Like how do you? How dare you feel that way? Because you're scared, and because you're in, living in fear, we all have to like bow to that. Like no way, dude. I'm done. So I, I saw so much of that. Like the hypocrisy turned around so quickly with like oh well we're gonna march for black lives matter and they obviously didn't understand that movement they didn't understand george floyd they didn't understand literally anything and then just a year later be like well screw them <laughs> if they don't want to get vaccinated and yeah. they can't go shopping with me i'm like you suck so hard i'm so done but I, I was patient then, and I was taking, I was writing very long threads with people, trying my best to oh, change minds. Oh, uh, you think about all of that time wasted, man. I know. I got a book out of it, though. So, you know, I That's had good. that in mind. I was like, I'm just going to turn this into a book. I'll, I changed everybody's names. You know, there's Hillary well, Clinton. It, at least you did and that. Stuff like that. So at it's least like, you did that. Because I had to. I can't tell you how many times that I have been like, like laying there uh, on on a on a on a in bed at the last thing I'm doing for the night, and I'm just scroll. I'm just trying to whatever, and I'm scrolling. Through, I see something, and I'm like, oh, I gotta say something, and I just, I'm I'm halfway through a tweet or a you know something on Tumblr or anything yeah. else like that. I said, nope, yeah, nope. It, well, it's no. what, like what's worth it, you know? Like, right. it's gonna take me away from my kids and family, uh, and then I'll be checking for the reply all day. Yes, no, nope, yeah. not doing it's, it. It's not, not a healthy it. way to live, and I shouldn't have done it. But like, it started when Trump was censored off, t was kicked off Twitter, 
and I wrote something like, I'm way more, I, I said it better than I'll say now, but I was like, I'm way more scared of people like rooting for censorship than I am of any like scary words. And I couldn't believe the response of people who were like, this is literally violence. You know, like this is, he was literally inciting violence. I'm like, it show is, me. It is it, literally the opposite. It's, yeah, literally the opposite. It's literally the opposite. You destroy the human language. So, I, you know, free speech is so important to me and just expression. And I want to hear all these conversations. I don't care if I agree with you or not. So I was like, I'm going to sit here like a masochist and listen to everyone. And, and literally arguing former professors at Manhattanville, <laughs> uh, everyone. And it felt like I was like up against everybody. I had a very, very few people, you know, coming to my defense. Not that I needed it, but it was nice to see everyone every now and then someone pop in. But yeah, no, I, I don't really do it so much anymore. When some of the most vile people get at me, like I, I will just be like, I'll just say something real quick and, and be out and like not worry about it. I got too much stuff going on to yeah, like do I, it. I, I, yeah, yeah, man. I, you know what? And maybe, maybe we have a uh, a reason a reason behind why people are acting like this. I have. I, I want to show you this on Mediaite. I grabbed this earlier on today. And also speaking of Roger Stone, right, says that there is a he says there's a demonic portal above the Biden White House that the media refuses to cover. This is not a joke. I believe it. Roger Stone claimed on Sunday a demonic portal that opened above the White House after President Joe Biden moved in is visible for those who are looking for it. He told conservative radio host Eric Metaxas, uh, Metaxas that he has seen it circling above the White House, as have others who spent enough time looking. During Sunday's edition of the Eric Metaxas sh uh, radio show, the host asked Stone about his views on the supernatural. Uh, Eric asked Stone to repeat him on air an anecdote he had previously shared. Quote, I think that a portal, a demonic portal, opened above the White House around the time that the Bidens moved in, Stone said. This was brought to my attention by a Christian who lives in North Florida who sent me a bunch of documents and also a bunch of notations from the Bible about portals. Stone said he first expressed skepticism, which Metaxas praised him for, and then Stone said, so I was skeptical about it, but I looked at the photos. Also, there's a live cam where you can actually see in real time, and there does appear to be something above the White House. At first you say, oh, maybe it's just a reflection. Maybe it's an, uh, um, an aerostat balloon. Maybe there's a logical explanation. Stone says that he, uh, he phoned a friend of his who was a police officer in Arlington, Virginia, and asked him to investigate it. He called me back about two and a half hours later and said, you're not going to believe this, but there's definitely something there. Other people were photographing it, Stone said he was told. He said, if one zooms in on whatever is floating above the Biden White House, it can be seen swirling like a cauldron. The host asked why the media has given no coverage to the portal. Stone responded, uh, the media doesn't cover a lot of things that are true. <laughs> the media was the media fell out of that swirling culture. <laughs> I know. Uh, like it's what I was saying earlier about trauma. Like DC is a obviously terribly traumatized place. I mean, in the first inverted world book, I talked to a lady who like witnessed one of those mystery colleges. You know about those, like where they can have portals supposedly, and they mm -hmm. can, a beast can enter through. So like that's what I think of when I see something like that. You know, there there is something at play during the darkest moments of the last few years. I kept thinking, like, there's got to be somewhere on this planet where we can just unplug the evil. Right. Like, it's just like in an old cartoon where it's like, oh, here it is, you know, and undo it. And it's like when I think of the culture, it's like, let's just zip that up real quick. How do we do it? I don't know. Um, but I think, I, man, that place is, is super demonic. Uh, well, we know th the way that the it the entire city was constructed, as far as the footprint of the city, like the the Masonic stuff. You're there, saying? There's a lot of that there yeah. too. So, as far as setting the entire city up to be almost like a uh, a giant temple in itself. Right. In fact, <clears throat> my buddy Corey down there in Phoenix, yeah. the first time I actually heard him before we became personal friends, he was on the Higher Side chats, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the the Free Masonic founding of Phoenix. Yeah, oh, I mean. A a Everything, things that you would never even hear about, you know, and uh, yes, it's inc it's incredible. The symbolism is baked into like the actual architecture and landscape, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard the? the you, ever, you ever listened to the Penny Royal podcast? I haven't. No. Well, podcasts like that. Anybody that goes into, I mean, that that'll. I think it's going to be right up your alley. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um, podcasts like that that go into geographical phenomena. 
that uh, in some, like for example, missing four one one. I know you know oh, about yeah. David Politis. Oh yeah. I always have questions about. Okay, well, is it just is it just the the forests because of something or another? Is it that there are large deposits of things like quartz crystal under the ground, which some people surmise is what's going on in that Penny Royal podcast in mm, Kentucky? Yep. But um, what about what about building a, a, a city to become some sort of an mm-hmm. energetic superconductor or to be built on top of something that is a, a meridian point right. that is, uh, I don't know, magnified by the structures you're putting on top of it? Right. Uh, th- who the hell knows mm-hmm. the kind of sciences that have already been mastered? Right. And here we are talking about the fucking episodes of the singer the mask the mask the mask <laughs> singer every that's night that's part of the plan yeah so, exactly uh, that's how they keep you sedated with all the other drugs but yeah i think we have such a very small understanding of our history that we look at things like even the pyramids you know they're probably something else than what we think they are um forests, not tombs <laughs> i don't think they're tombs and i think people there's probably natural things that are like conductors for who knows the supernatural other dimensions who knows what but there's also things that people construct and you know when they bake these symbols into things it's the they are summoning something dark uh and what better place to summon demons than you know dc what better place well i gotta say it, it um it's been great to have you on man yeah it's really has been. i love it well, any, anytime you want to come up, and anytime you are uh, on the road, you let me know. All right, awesome. We'll figure it out, especially yeah. if it's for like a Saturday night show. Yeah, all right. We do a one Saturday night show a, a month, and that's usually something that is real just, oh, we, we pack the hookahs and just chill out and, and just talk about whatever the fuck. Awesome. But um, we got to do more of this. I def- I wish you luck with everything else that's going on. Your, Thank you. uh, you, what you've contributed to tim cast's sphere of influence is obviously very very high value and i i hope that i can't wait to hear how your uh your kanye series has been received yeah thank you i'm getting uh he liked the story i guess so that's nice uh, <laughs> i wasn't sure how he's gonna take it but uh it's been I, the, the feedback has been overwhelming and uh it's so much like positivity and that's like the best compliment I could receive. So he did he text you his uh, his approval? He hearted the thing and he was like, he seemed like he was good. I, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot since <laughs> this last trip. So I think he had a pretty good idea. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a wild week. It, I mean, if you read it, I don't want to give away the ending because it's just so wild. And for people like, well, just like uh, writing, like I got to end up writing with him in the very end, like the Instagram post. You know? Oh, it's I like, saw that. You know, it's he like le- so, he left. Uh, I'll, I'll just I'll spoil. Yeah. I don't want to spoil yeah, no, it. Though. It's, all, it's all good. Like I, it's amazing. Like I just get to I'm alone in a room like with his music and he has me writing words. Right. So that was like, whoa, you know, the best thing ever after, you know, our years in bands and bands are everything. Music is my life. You know, not that I make it anymore. So that was really beautiful. And uh, we've continued this like relationship where we just talk every now and then. And uh, he'll hit me up with words and I'll hit him back with ideas. And it's it's been really, it's like a lot of fun. It's so really are you, cool. are you, you're writing lyrics with him now? <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that. I don't know what I'm doing, but I did on that day. And we are going back and forth with ideas. And uh, just like, it's, a, it's the most interesting and challenging experience of like, it's just like the classrooms, honestly, in, in, in teaching, where I would have us all sit down and we take an idea and we all pick it apart and try to make it the best for whosoever idea it was, right? So it's like, might not be the best thing for me, but I'm thinking of like, who's going to be the voice of this and make it the best for them. So yeah, we will go back and forth with just random ideas and it's it's like a really interesting experience. It's like another type of boot camp. Like I got a boot camp with Tim, right? And Tim is taught like, it's like a DIY boot camp of how to like, you just do this, you build this do your thing you know and uh, so i'm just like you know i look up to like someone like tim look up someone like kanye and it's just like i feel very very blessed that they take me seriously enough to do this and i get to have conversations with them and like just learn you know well keep your eyes peeled your ears peeled keep your head on a swivel i mean you're 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 entering into the the deep end of the pool here man <laughs> it feels like it yeah it is <laughs> well, but thank you so much for t- the time tonight i want to get to this real quick we have a couple more super chats here rise of tire says a bwg ghost documentary series dude sets out to prove ghosts victims of serial killer lead him to find nine bodies oh sick uh it's on amazon there's seven installments seriously the greatest most important documentary on ghosts of all time all right rook castle says um Let's see, it says, Bible equals basic instructions before leaving Earth. States 365 times we should not be in the spirit of fear. 
Mm. Um, Homegoy says, fascinating. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. And also, uh, I just want to make sure we got everybody. Yep, that's it. Uh, that's all I have for you, ladies and gentlemen. It is Tuesday night. There's nothing on the on the network programming tonight after here on quite frankly TV. But tomorrow is another day. We've got Jay Dyer on the show tomorrow. We'll be going into some Christmas deep dives. That'll be fun. And uh, hopefully it's not too long before we welcome Shane Cashman back to the studio or on Zoom. <laughs> I look forward to it, man. Thanks right. for having me. Oh, where, where can people find your work? Do you have a... Yeah. I have your link tree in the description oh, cool. of the episode. Oh, yeah. That's that's great. No, I'm Shane Cashman on all the platforms and, uh, you know, TimCast.com. You can find a lot of my writing and the Inverted World stuff and Tales from the Inverted World on YouTube, all of our, uh, you know, uh, illustrated and, and, and narrated stories. And uh, yeah, if you look at the link tree, you'll see everything else. It's been great, man. Have a good one. Thanks, man. You too. I'll, so I'll talk to you all tomorrow night. And, uh, and thanks for everything. Good evening. I'll catch you on the flip side. Quite frankly, is film before a live studio audience. And now, our super chatters, starting with Poopy, Jane Jones, happy birthday, Stosub, and Albert Frederick, happy birthday, Lisa. Thank you to everybody over there on Pilled. We are releasing the scratching as we speak. And on uh, Rockfin, and on Twitch, and on Rumble, and on DLive, and YouTube, all the rest. Theta, thank you guys so much. We'll see you tomorrow night. Be well. They sent me to a psychiatrist all morning. I took like a million tests. A psychiatrist? Yeah, you know, because I got suspended and everything. They sent you to a psychiatrist? Yeah. But that's crazy. That's all nonsense. That's nothing but a, a racket for the Jews.